Introduction There was a time, not so very long ago, when an astrological consultation was something people sought because they wanted predictions about the future, money, love, health, and, if there was any character analysis involved at all, it consisted primarily of the astrological, cookbook kind. You are a Gemini and therefore you are clever, versatile and articulate. This listing of static personality traits was either already well known to the client, in which case there was not a great deal of value to be gained from such a reading, or the client could not immediately identify with the character traits described, in which case the validity of astrology itself was consequently held in question. Naturally there are still many people who go to an astrologer for these reasons, predictions and a pat on the back about one's apparently fixed and unalterable behavior, and there are still many astrologers who will happily oblige such clients by providing the information requested. But over the years, particularly the last five years, there has been a gradual change not only in the reasons why people seek out astrologers, but also in the kind of people who seek them out. And the astrological community has in turn met this challenge and has begun to formulate a different and much more creative kind of astrology, built firmly upon tradition but adapted to the changing and more sophisticated needs of the client. There was a time, not so very long ago, when an astrologer's clientele was fairly predictable. A fair number of show business people, notoriously superstitious, anyway, and a smattering of upwardly spiritually mobile aspirants hoping for a formula for enlightenment without mess. This, too, has been changing. Now the astrologer's client may be anybody at all, from a government minister to a secretary, from a doctor to an artist, from a computer programmer to a fashion model. Having one's horoscope interpreted as no longer an obscure sort of entertainment or a replacement for making choices in life. The reasons for this shift lie in part in the increasing interest in, and investigation of, serious astrology, which has helped break down the barriers which often spring from the ignorant layman's assumptions about what astrology can and cannot do. But this increasing interest is itself a symptom of something. There may be some quite profound underlying reasons why we, as astrologers, are beginning to be taken more seriously and why we, as astrologers, are increasingly being challenged to take ourselves more seriously, and more professionally, as well. For one thing, the astrological consultant has, willingly or not, been usurping what was once the role of the priest, the physician, and the psychiatrist. The client is no longer merely a gullible soul seeking fortune-telling, nor an esoterically inclined aspirant wondering what he or she was up to in the last incarnation. The client may be depressed without external cause, anxious or fearful, in the throes of an emotional crisis, or the breakup of a relationship, seeking serious insight into potential vocational opportunities, or troubled by apathy and an inability to make anything of his or her talents. In short, the client may have psychological problems and questions, and may be intelligently seeking insight into these problems in order to have a greater range of choices and responses, a situation which can apply to just about anybody at a certain crossroads in life. And with due respect to those readers who might be members of the clergy or of psychiatry, this client with psychological problems may often fail to find the tolerance or depth of understanding that the clergy might justifiably be expected to provide, receiving meaningless aphorisms instead, or may fail to obtain the insight into symptoms and the openness to discuss them without clinical labeling which the orthodox medical establishment sometimes finds rather difficult to offer. So, willingly or not, consciously or not, the consultant astrologer has arrived as a counselor. And those astrologers who heatedly deny this psychological aspect of their work are at best naive and at worst destructive through their ignorance of what they are really dealing with. But for the most part, Astrology has responded to this new role by accepting the psychological dimension of the study, and whatever term we wish to use, psychological astrology, astrological psychology, or simply good and insightful astrological counseling, astrology is coming of age and taking its place among the helping professions. There is another thread to this fabric which is being woven out of the marriage of astrology and psychology, and that is the thread of meaning. Meaning is essential for life, and human beings seem to require it. Without meaning, there is often the feeling that we have nothing to live for, nothing to hope for, 
No reason to struggle for anything and no direction in life. Whether it is ultimately up to us to create our own meaning, or whether it is our task to discover some grand cosmic scheme or divine intention, the search for guidelines, goals, and a sense of purpose is an innate drive in all of us. And the problem of meaning has, in the last few decades, become an urgent one. Disillusionment with traditional religious structures accounts for some of this crisis of meaning which is upon us, and the increasing complexity of our lives in a world beset by new and daunting problems and challenges for which there are no existent guidelines or methods of approach accounts for even more of it. Loss of meaning is often the root from which spring the myriad psychological problems which masquerade as clinical symptoms, and loss of meaning is often the crisis which drives the client to seek an astrologer. The astrologer who uses the chart as a counseling tool is in the unique position of helping others in this all-important search to find meaning in their lives. It is a task to be taken humbly, yet seriously. The man experiencing a difficult marriage with natal Venus square Pluto can be helped if he can find some meaning or relevance in his relationship troubles. What can he learn about himself through these issues? Why has he landed himself in this situation? What are the connections to earlier events in his life? Questions such as these may reveal a theme or pattern which he is unconsciously attracting and living out. A woman with Saturn conjunct Neptune in the 10th house, struggling to forge a career while facing debilitating anxieties, insecurities, and fears of failure, can be helped if these problems are appreciated and given significance within the larger context of her whole life and development. With the astrologer, she can explore the deeper archetypal conflict underlying her career problems, and what the struggle is asking her to learn about, face up to, and deal within herself. Because of her dilemma, she may be pushed into developing certain qualities, resources or strengths which she might never have bothered to develop if the issue were not there in the first place, and this glimpse of an intelligible, reason, why we suffer is often the magical ingredient which can distill confidence and clarity out of a painful and confusing situation. Sign and house placements, aspects, transits, and progressions, not to mention life itself, all become more meaningful when understood in this way. Psychological astrology has, like the old Roman god Janus, a double face. It can provide a surgical scalpel which cuts through to the underlying motives, complexes, and family inheritance which lie behind the manifest problems and difficulties which the individual faces, and it can also provide a lens through which can be viewed the teleology and purpose of our conflicts in context of the overall meaning of the individual's journey. Both faces ultimately turn toward a central mystery, the mystery of the human psyche of which astrology is both our oldest and our newest map. The seminars in this book deal with the experiences of childhood and the development, dynamics, and structure of the personality. They are part of the training program of the Center for Psychological Astrology, founded and co-directed by the authors, with branches in both London and Zurich. The center was established to promote, explore, and encourage the use of astrology, both as a vehicle to self-knowledge and as an effective approach to counseling. These seminars, and transcriptions of others which will follow in further volumes of this series, are components in the three-year course of seminars, supervision groups, and classes which comprise the in-depth training in psychological astrology which the center provides. In editing these transcripts, we have made every attempt to preserve a sense of the flavor and feeling of each of these one-day events. The reader is invited to fully experience and participate in them. It is hoped that the serious student of astrology will gain not only enriching insights into how to interpret the chart psychologically, but also will grow in the kind of personal self-understanding and self-knowledge which are such necessary ingredients for productive counseling of any kind. Liz Green Howard Sassport is November, 1986. Part 1. The Stages of Childhood. The Childhood Shows the Man, as Morning Shows the Day. John Milton. It's never too late to have a happy childhood. Anonymous. Your Inborn Images. In today's seminar we are going to explore what the chart reveals about our childhood experiences, traumas and adjustments and how these relate to our current lives. We are going to explore childhood and the past for a reason, in order to unclutter the present. It's no use just wallowing around in what you think your mother or your father did to you, 
but you can go back and examine your early experiences in order to understand the present better and move forward in your lives right now. We deal with the past when it's standing in the way of the future. Right from the beginning, I want to draw a basic distinction between the way in which many schools of traditional psychology view childhood experiences and the way psychological astrology looks at early life events. Certain branches of traditional psychology uphold the idea that the child is born a blank slate upon which different things are subsequently written. This is called the tabula rasa theory, the notion that how other people treated you in early life gives rise to certain patterns or scripts which then determine your self-image and your expectations of what will happen to you later in life. Let me explain this further. Around different experiences in childhood, certain decisions or attitudes are formed or made about ourselves or about life in general. These might be called, existential life statements. For instance, if mother isn't very adept at looking after you, then a pattern or expectation or statement about life is formed such as, the world is not such a safe place to survive in, or, those I need most will let me down. Or if father storms out, disappears and abandons the family when you are three years old, it may give rise to a belief or expectation or statement about life, such as, men are unreliable, or, I'm so bad I drive people away. Early experiences cut very deeply, you've heard me use the analogy before that if you take a young tree or sapling and make a small cut in its bark, when it grows into a mature tree, it will have a large cut in it. What happens early in life forms a very deep impression on us. Very often these impressions are embedded in the unconscious, we don't even remember them. But we carry those expectations and beliefs around with us and we continue to perceive and organize experience according to them. In other words, how we see and evaluate the present is conditioned by what has happened in the past. Sometimes this is referred to as, psychic determinism. Any particular mental event or phenomenon is connected to chronologically preceding events. Even a fantasy about what happened in the past can determine how we interpret the present, it doesn't have to be something that actually happened. So, if you imagined that you drove father away, when in actual fact he left for entirely different reasons, the earlier fantasy will still influence your later expectations. Later in life, we selectively perceive or pick out of any circumstance those things which support our assumptions and beliefs, and we fail to see what doesn't fit into these expectations. Someone once said that, life obliges our expectations. In short, our beliefs and expectations give rise to our experience of reality which in turn reinforces the original beliefs. Now psychological astrology views all this slightly differently. Rather than just being born a blank slate and having things done to you which then lead you to form opinions about life and yourself, psychological astrology believes that you are already born with an innate predisposition which expects certain things to happen. It is not just the childhood conditioning which is of primary importance, it is your own inner nature as seen through placements in the birth chart which predisposes you to perceive experience in a certain way. Certain inborn archetypal expectation structure what you filter out of experience as a child. I'll explain this more precisely. An archetype can be defined as a mental representation of an instinct. Because human beings have been around for so long, eons of time and the evolutionary processes have built up and structured into our psyches certain expectations which are passed down generation after generation, a kind of cell wisdom. One of our built-in expectations is that there is going to be a mother, or to get even more basic, that there is going to be a nipple. Even in the womb we have an expectation of a nipple, it is carried in our cell memory. In our cell memory is also the expectation of a father, and the expectation of growth and death. All these images are there latent in us even before we have an actual experience of such things. We are already born with an image of mother, an image of that archetype, and we are already born with an image of father, an image of birth, an image of growth, an image of death, etc. But different people have slightly different images of these archetypal phenomena. There are different varieties and brands of these images. For instance, the moon has to do with mother and all of you have the moon in your chart, so you all have an expectation of mother already there from birth, even before you actually encounter her. But the nature of your image of mother, the more exact kind of mother you are anticipating, is shown by your sign placement of the moon and what sort of aspects are made to it. 
Similarly, you have right from the beginning, a sense that there will be a father. Everyone has this, you all have the sun in your charts and you can take the sun to mean father. But the sign placement and aspects of the sun will more exactly color and describe your own particular inborn image of what father is going to be like for you. Remember that perception is a function of expectation and that content is a function of context. What you are expecting to see will influence how you perceive what is actually there. Inborn images and archetypes organize and structure what we experience. So, if you are born with Moon trine Jupiter then you have an inborn expectation of abundance and expansion coming through Mother. Because this is what you expect to see, your perception will be selective, and you will tend to register more readily the times when she is being generous, expansive and Jupiterian, rather than other times when she may be cold and restricting. But, if you are born with Moon conjunct Saturn, then you already expect some difficulty or coldness around the mother and you are innately attuned to notice the time she fits that picture more than when she acts in other ways. We will get into a fuller discussion of aspects later, but the point I wish to make now is the distinction between many branches of traditional psychology and psychological astrology. Traditional psychology often blames the parents for what they do to us, but psychological astrology says that we are partly responsible for how we experience our parents, because our tendency to interpret the mother's and father's actions on the basis of inborn assumptions and beliefs about what we are likely to meet. What the parents are actually like will serve to drive these innate impressions in deeper or perhaps serve to mediate or mollify some of our basic expectations of them. If we expect a very bad mother and she turns out to be loving and an extremely safe container, some of our negative expectations may be toned down. If we are born with an inner image of a terrible mother, we will expect to find a terrible mother. So, if it turns out that our actual mother, for whatever reason, cannot cope with us, then that archetypal expectation is driven home deeper. It is given flesh and bone based on our actual experience of her. For example, let's say that a boy child is born with moon square Pluto. A possible inborn image of mother based on this aspect could be that she is potentially dangerous or life-threatening, the archetype of the moon, mother, is connected to that of Pluto, a destructive force. Mother may not actually be all that much a Plutonic type person, but the child is particularly sensitive to when she has those moods and phases, so notices this in her more. One day she gives him a particularly good feed and puts him down, expecting that he should be happy and content. But for some reason, his moon square Pluto is activated that day, maybe a fast transit to it by the moon or Venus, and even after his good feed and after he is gently put down into his cot, for no obvious reason, the negative image of mother is activated in his psyche. So he starts screaming and crying. Now, mother has just fed him well, what has he got to cry about? If the mother reacts by shaking him and being frustrated and angry, then he thinks, see, I knew all along she was a witch. In this way, the inborn negative image of mother is driven home deeper. If the mother doesn't react to his frustration in that manner, but picks him up, holds him and contains his screaming fit without responding negatively to it, the image of the bad mother he was born with is mediated and mollified. Well, maybe she is not so bad after all. Perhaps it would be good for mothers to study the charts of their babies to derive a sense of what the child could be projecting onto them, and learn how to do a dance with these projections so they can attempt to help mollify the more negative ones. To sum up, what we are talking about is what is known as the nature versus nurture conflict in psychology. Those who believe in the nurture side believe that it is how we are treated as children that determines who we are. Those who believe in the nature side believe that we are born with a certain nature which then determines how we experience life. Psychological astrology obviously has a bias towards the idea that we are born with a certain innate nature, that our archetypal conditioning pre-dates our childhood conditioning. It's undoubtedly a mixture of both, but psychological astrology would put inborn nature first and actual childhood conditioning second, because we have a tendency to perceive the events and people surrounding us in childhood through the spectacles of our own nature. If we are wearing blue glasses, life looks blue. If we are wearing red glasses, life looks red. Most importantly, it is the birth chart which depicts our archetypal conditioning and expectations. 
archetypal patterns as shown in the birth chart. Let's do a little work with the chart. A very clear way to see the basic patterns and expectations you are born with is to take certain key aspects and placements in the chart and get a sense of what statements about life or archetypal expectations these might describe. This is what I want you to be thinking about throughout the day, that every aspect or placement in your chart describes some kind of pattern in you. These patterns give rise to statements, beliefs, or assumptions about yourself or about life. For instance, what do you think might be the belief or expectation of someone born with Moon Square Saturn? What might this person's statement be about the archetype of mother, even before the mother is actually experienced? Audience. Some sense of rejection or coldness. Howard. Make that into a statement. Audience. Mother is cold. Howard. Okay, one statement might be, mother is cold. What other statements can come from this aspect? Audience. Mother is rigid and unloving or inadequate. Howard. Yes, but what kind of statements might come up about a person's own emotions? Audience. There might be a statement like, I have trouble with my emotions. Howard. Right. What else is the moon? The moon has to do with getting one's needs fulfilled, so what kind of statement is there about having one's basic needs met? Audience. My basic needs don't get met. Howard. Yes, this is often the experience of those with Moon Square Saturn, some difficulty in having their emotional and even physical needs satisfied. Okay, forget the Moon for now. What if you have Venus Square Saturn? Venus is the archetype that has to do with union, with the image of the beloved. What kind of statement might come from that aspect? Audience. I will be rejected in relationship. Howard. Something like that, or even something more basic like, in relationship, Venus, I am going to meet trouble, Saturn. But don't forget that Saturn also implies hard work. So on another level, there may be a belief or expectation that, I'm going to have to work hard at making a relationship. What if you have Venus trine Jupiter? What kind of life statement or assumption about relationship might you have with that aspect? Audience. My beloved is going to be expansive and open me up. Howard. Yes, and even something like, I have so much to give in relationship. The archetype of union, Venus, is brought together in some way with the archetype of expansion, Jupiter. These are the kinds of expectations people with this aspect are born with. It exists even before they have a relationship, before they date anyone. This is their image of what they are going to experience through Venus. If that is what they are expecting to meet, that is what they will notice, look for, or help set up, consciously or unconsciously. Obviously life is more complicated than this. Someone may have Venus both square Saturn and trine Jupiter, as well as Moon conjunct Uranus. What I want you to do today is to look at your chart and reflect on what some of the statements you have about life might be which fit with the aspects and placements in your chart. We'll be examining childhood experiences, because in childhood we can often see these patterns and life statements operating the most clearly. They come sharply into focus in childhood. We are born with skeletal expectations, a framework of what we will experience, and then our actual experiences as children add layers to these expectations, giving them flesh and substance. Different archetypes are brought out at different stages of life. Point one. For instance, at birth the part of the chart which is foreground is the ascendant. So, issues around your ascendant will be brought up at the birth experience. For the first two years of life the main drive is survival and getting your needs fulfilled, and the principle in the chart which is most important then is the moon. Therefore, your innate patterning around the moon will be fleshed out between birth and two years old. Archetypes come through drives and drives come through foreground issues. Between the ages of two and four, the drive is to assert yourself, to be more autonomous. You start to walk, learn to talk, you want to assert your individuality more and flex your muscles. At this time the foreground issue is greater autonomy. The archetypes that are coming through this issue are those of power, self-assertion, self-control, mastery of environment and potency. The main planets activated in connection to these principles are the Sun and Mars. So between two and four issues around the Sun and Mars will be more clearly brought to focus in your life. 
After four, when we become more aware of mother and father as a unit, issues around relationship come out and the archetype of Venus comes to the fore. Your patterns around Venus can be seen during that Oedipal phase. Working with patterns. Our purpose today is not just discovering our patterns but also to begin to do something about working with them if we wish to do so, or if we are not happy with them. And even if it is impossible to change or radically alter some of these patterns, we can at least work on changing our attitudes towards them. I want to talk about patterns in general. There is a poem by an American poetess, Amy Lowell, called Patterns and the last line always stuck in my head when I read it in high school. Right at the end she says, Christ, what are patterns for? I don't believe that the deeper self sends you difficult patterns or lots of squares and oppositions just to torture you, I don't think the self is that wicked. Nonetheless, we are born with certain archetypal beliefs and expectations which we have to work with. Maybe it's related to heredity and genetics, that we inherit unresolved issues or conflicts from our ancestors, that what they have gone through or contended with is passed down to us through some sort of psychogene, just as physical characteristics are passed down to us. Genes are passed down from generation to generation and we not only inherit physical traits, but we also inherit psychological issues or unfinished emotional business. Maybe an ancestor, or set of ancestors, had trouble with the right use of assertion and power and you are born with Mars conjunct Saturn square Pluto. You inherit something of their unworked through problems with assertion and it is up to you to redeem this in some way. Or you might inherit a dilemma between one set of traits from certain ancestors and another set of traits from other ancestors. Let's say that certain of your ancestors were Jupiterian swashbuckling pirates while others were Saturnian local magistrates. You might then be born with Jupiter square Saturn. One part of you wants to be free and expansive, Jupiter, and another part is pulled toward conventionality and settling down, Saturn. Or perhaps we are born with particular patterns, expectations, and beliefs because of something to do with past lives, karma and reincarnation. Put extremely simply, if you had certain difficult experiences with mothers in previous lifetimes, you may be born with an expectation of difficulty with a mother in this life. Some challenging moon aspects or hard placements in the tenth, if you take the tenth to mean mother. Or maybe you were an incompetent mother in a previous lifetime, so you are born with an image around the moon which reflects this. Once you become aware that you have a bias to see things in a certain context, or that you have certain inborn assumptions or beliefs, then you can start working within that framework to gradually expand the borders of a belief or pattern to allow for other alternatives. Let's take the moon square Saturn as an example, which we already suggested might be the experience of difficulty with the mother or getting the needs fulfilled. But, on another level, if we stay within the parameters of these two archetypal principles, the moon and Saturn, then this aspect could also have something to do with learning, Saturn, about the emotions, the moon. In other words, moon square Saturn also means learning about and working on emotional issues and working on the relationship with the mother. On one level Saturn is symbolic of difficulty and restriction, but on another level it indicates the mastery of something that comes through hard work and effort. The poet Goethe, who had Saturn rising in Scorpio, once said, it is in limitation that the master first shows himself. Saturn points out what is weak, lacking or inadequate, but also where, through effort and work, we become strong. Although we are stuck with the archetype of the Moon being influenced by the archetype of Saturn, we can try to find more creative ways of bringing together these two principles rather than getting stuck on a level where we are aware only of the pain. Once we discover the underlying pattern and archetypal principles involved, what they mean and the different levels they can manifest on, we can try to bring them together in other ways. We still may need the pain and difficulty, but other things become possible as well. Audience. That's interesting. I have Moon conjunct Saturn and I lead antenatal classes for mothers. I always felt that by working with mothers, I was working through something myself. Howard. It is possible that if you use the aspect up on one level or dimension, you are less likely to have to experience it on other levels. Of course, you may still need the challenge of Moon Saturn on a personal level to trigger a certain kind of growth. 
Nonetheless, as much as possible, I would encourage people to consciously create structures in their lives through which aspects can express themselves. Take the Sun square Neptune for example. The Sun represents a masculine principle, assertion, expression and spirit. Neptune touching it brings in the qualities of sensitivity and creativity as well as weakness, dissolution, dissipation and elusiveness. If we take the Sun to represent the image of Father, the person's experience of Father, the Sun, will be colored by Neptune. The Father will receive the Neptunian projection and the child with this aspect will be sensitive to the Father's Neptunian side. Sometimes certain fathers act this out rather well, they drink too much, become dependent on drugs, are ill or ailing, psychologically absent or simply disappear off to sea. Even if the father's chart isn't all that Neptunian, the child with sun in aspect to Neptune will register the times he is that way. In some way the father cannot be relied upon or isn't tangibly present. Or the father is creative, artistic and very sensitive. I once saw the chart of the daughter of a well-known actor in America. She had the sun square Neptune. The Neptune came not just through his acting talent, but also because of his fame, he was in great demand and often away from home. In her case, she had to sacrifice, Neptune, the father, she had to give him up to the world. She had a lot of pain around that and in some ways she was still trying to attract his attention and make herself special to him. This also can happen to the children of clergymen, the father belongs as much to the congregation as to the family. Consequently, children with this aspect may grow up with a wounded sense of their worth, specialness and identity which is related to a loose connection to the father. There may be a statement about life such as, I don't know who I am, or, I have to give up what I want. Now, if you are born with sun square Neptune, you are stuck with having Neptune affecting the sun, there is really no way you can avoid that. You can't even blame others for it because it's your own archetypal pre-conditioning. But you could think about ways you might bring the Sun and Neptune together more constructively or more positively than just wandering around with a weak or nebulous sense of identity or power. Can you think of any way people with this aspect could consciously connect their identity with Neptune in a more constructive way than feeling dissolved or confused? Audience. What about through doing something artistic or creative? Howard. Yes, they might work on opening themselves up as a channel through which artistic expression could flow. They could take up dance or poetry as a way of expressing themselves, give themselves to the muse. Or, they could try something like meditation, twice a day sitting to meditate, dissolving and letting go of the ego boundaries and merging with something greater than the self. Doing this, they are using up some of the way this aspect might manifest. They are taking responsibility for bringing the archetypes of the Sun and Neptune together in different ways than just being confused or vague. They are creating alternatives for the use of these energies. Of course, if they meditated too much, they would end up spaced out and back to go. An archetype can express itself on many different levels, and if it isn't working well on one level, you can start experimenting with others. This also applies to house placements. The fifth house has to do with children as well as personal creativity, such as painting, drawing, writing and music. If you are having trouble with your children, something like Saturn conjunct Uranus in the fifth square Mars in the eighth, a good suggestion is to go out and become involved in other levels of the fifth house, other things besides being with or having children. Take a course in art, join an amateur dramatic society or dance group and then you are using up some of what is in the fifth house. Other spheres besides children will appropriate the placements there and it takes the pressure off the relationship with your children to carry the burden of it. I have Mars conjunct Saturn and Pluto in my seventh house, the house of partnership. When Zip Dobins looked at my chart many years ago, she advised me to form a business partnership with someone. She suggested that the business relationship would use up some of the energy of Mars Saturn Pluto so that it wouldn't have to all come through more intimate or personal relationships. I tried it and it worked. I started a meditation center with a Capricorn friend of mine and simultaneously my more personal relationships became less tense and complex. The business partnership carried some of what the conjunction in my seventh indicated. But, as usual, I am diverting.
I want to discuss how we can work with some of our patterns, life statements, scripts and chart placements in order to experience them more fully, understand them more fully, and then transform and transmute them if possible. As I've already said, patterns or existential life statements are principles by which we live. Patterns give rise to the kinds of dreams we have, to the kinds of traumas we have, and to the kinds of illnesses we have. Our patterns and beliefs set the parameters of what we are going to experience in life. Paradigm is the Greek word for pattern. A paradigm is a conceptual framework through which we view experience. For example, before the 16th century, there was the widely held paradigm that the sun moved around the earth. This was a belief upon which the perception of reality was based. Another word for paradigm or pattern is something called a mental set. For instance, a very depressed person may have a mental set that the world is out to get him and he will organize his experience of the world according to this mental set. He'll see or interpret experiences as threatening and he won't even see the ones which are life-supporting because he can only view the world through his particular framework. Related to this is the idea of self-image or self-model. Some people call the self-image a meta-paradigm or meta-set, because psychologically speaking, our self-image determines so much of what happens to us and so much of the way in which we perceive the world. For instance, a man who is fat may have a self-image of being a fat man. Let's say he goes on a diet and really slims down. However, if he is still walking around with a self-image of himself as fat, he will probably just get fat again. Experiencing and Understanding Patterns The first step in working with our patterns and beliefs is to fully experience them. Different patterns or beliefs related to various aspects in the chart might be statements like, I have to struggle to survive, or something like, all men are bastards, or, those I love, leave me. Experiencing a pattern means fully getting in touch with it. There's an exercise which is designed to help you do this. I am not going to do it with you today, but you can try it sometime. Look at your chart and pick out an aspect in it, let's say Venus square Saturn, and find what your statement about life is which relates to this placement. The statement may be, I'm not good enough to be loved. Then give a lecture to another person based on your statement. Really exaggerate it, really dramatize it. I'm so awful and ugly and disgusting, how could anyone love me? I'm a crawling insect with nothing to give, pure yuck. Etc. Feel the impact of your life statement and this aspect on your body and feelings. Or if you have Sun square Pluto and your statement is, men are deceitful or out to undermine me, then give a lecture to someone on that, fully bring this belief out into the open and play it up. There may be other parts of you which think differently, but during this exercise just focus on that pattern or belief. You have to fully experience something before you can begin to disidentify from it or transmute it. You can't transform something you haven't owned or acknowledged in yourself. Therapy can help bring out patterns, a chart reading can help bring out patterns. Once we have experienced what the pattern is, the next step is understanding it. Take a closer look at it, think about it and reflect on it. Examine the archetypal principles involved in the pattern and how it relates to your childhood experiences. Astrology gives us a language and a framework through which these things can be examined and explored. Looking at the chart not only puts you in touch with your basic archetypal patterning but enables you to step back and reflect on it. Ways of possibly transforming patterns. After experiencing a pattern and gaining some understanding of it, the next step is transmutation. Finding some way to change that statement about life, to change that belief, assumption or expectation. The task is to redirect the archetypes involved into some new life statement, to re-choose how to use the energies involved. I don't think it's easy to get rid of an old pattern because it has quite a hold on us. And if you try to fight a belief or assumption you have about life, you are actually giving a message to yourself about how important that belief is and you may drive it in more. Rather than trying to fight it, I think it's better to create a new belief and pay a little more attention to the new one. In this way, you are not trying to destroy the old pattern, but rather you are starving it of attention by creating an alternative belief or expectation. You create a shift in dominance from the old one to the new one. I'll give you an example from a chart I did the other day. A 20-year-old woman came for a reading. 
She had Uranus conjunct Pluto in Virgo in the 10th house in opposition to the Sun conjunct Mars in Pisces in the 4th. One of her basic statements about life was that she was weak and ineffective compared to other people. She was very scared of the world. As the opposition from the 10th to the 4th suggests, her early home life had been disruptive. Her father left home when she was still young and part of her sense of weakness might stem from her inability as a child to do anything to stop the parents splitting up. For a young child, the breaking up of the parental marriage is akin to the whole world falling apart and splitting into two and she couldn't do anything about this. It is as if she felt her will, Sun and Mars in Pisces, was overruled by an impersonal force of destruction and change, Uranus and Pluto opposing the Sun and Mars. In addition, she saw her mother as very strong, powerful and slightly threatening, all of which added to her own sense of inferiority. In this case the Uranus-Pluto conjunction in Virgo in the tenth fitted well with the mother. The girl projected her image of the dominant and powerful mother onto the world. For her it was dangerous and more powerful than she was, full of people bigger and stronger than her. Now, it would be hard for her to rid herself entirely of the belief that the world out there was a threatening place beyond her control, her early environment had brought out such a belief, but we talked about the possibility that the world also had some okay aspects to it and that it was possible for her to be effective and have some influence. We worked on forming a new life statement which included the old one but added another possibility onto it. Yes, the world at times can seem overwhelming, threatening and unsafe, but sometimes people are all right and it's also possible to have some influence in it. After all, she did have an angular Sun conjunct Mars and two powerful planets in the house of career. We expanded her life statement into an and. And structure. It is sometimes dangerous and it also can be on your side. Then we discussed ways she could be more effective in the world, and I mentioned the possibility of her training as a makeup artist. Somehow the Virgo Pisces opposition had made me think of that. It turned out that she had been discussing that possibility with someone just the other day. It would be a field where she could use her Piscean imagination and sensitivity along with her potential Virgo technical ability. I just know she would be good at it. You could see by looking at her, by the way she presented herself, that she would have a sense of what looked right or didn't look right. In short, a good portion of our session together centered on the idea that she could be effective, that she could have some power and ability, and that such traits didn't just belong to other people as her original life statement insinuated. We didn't deny her original life statement, we just tagged other possibilities onto it. The least she could do would be to try the expanded life statement out and see what happens. The element of choice. There is a question you can ask yourself now. Are the beliefs I am currently holding, the beliefs I have about myself, about men, about women, about the world in general, are these beliefs consistent with what I want in my life and with what I want in my future? What we are doing is adding the element of choice, the element of consciousness, the element of being a creative force in your own life rather than just taking what's given and living it out in any old way. I find this very helpful to bear in mind when I am working on my own patterns. For instance, I am just about to begin work on a second book and I am already intensely agitated about it. I'm already thinking, oh my god, I'm contracting to do this book next year and I'm not going to have the time and it's going to be a failure and I'm just going to die because of it. I have three planets in Leo, so I'm allowed to be somewhat overdramatic. As I revealed earlier, Mars in my chart is conjunct Saturn and Pluto and Mars has a lot to do with how we start things. So my pattern around starting things, Mars, has something to do with dread and fear, Saturn, and when it gets mixed up with Pluto, it becomes a life-death issue. Because this conjunction is in Leo, these issues are particularly activated when it comes to expressing myself creatively. But it helps if I can catch myself midstream and say, wait a minute Howard, are these thoughts and fears in line with what you want to have happen in your life? Now, I don't want to die next year necessarily, I don't want to be tortured and not have enough time to do the book, so these thoughts are not congruent with what I want to make happen. I experienced and lived out all these fears and misgivings fully when I worked on the first book last year and I don't see any value in going through that nightmare again. So now when I start having these negative thoughts, I acknowledge they are not consistent with what I want to have happen. 
I would like to have the time to work on my book, to enjoy being creative and to enjoy the writing. I'm not denying that my fears and apprehensions are there, but I am shifting my attention from them to what I actually want to make happen. Robert Fritz II, who is the founder of DMA, a useful course designed to help you create your life more the way you want it, stresses the point that the key to your future is right now, not the past, but right now. I hear so many people lament, well, such and such happened to me when I was young and therefore I'm stuck with being a certain way now. If you believe that the past determines your future, then you energize that happening. But if you believe that the key to your future is right now, you have a different premise on which to base your life. How you are going to work with things now becomes more important than what happened to you in the past. Robert Fritz points out that it helps to think of your beliefs and statements about life not as hard and cold facts, but as opinions. So if you have a belief that you are unlovable, Venus square Saturn, try seeing that as an opinion rather than as an absolute truth about yourself. Then ask yourself, is this opinion in tune with or going against what I would like to have happen? Does the belief or opinion that you are unlovable support what you would like to have happen? Do you really want that to happen? Do you really want to be unlovable? This is what you can start doing today. Create some other beliefs that you would like to see happen and focus on these. When the original belief comes up, you are not denying it, but you are creating some alternative things which you would like to see happen. Speaking astrologically, when you re-choose your statements you have to stick within the archetypes of the planets involved in the aspect or placement you are working with. I do think we are, in a sense, fated to this degree. Audience. Take something like a Mars-Saturn square. Instead of focusing in on negative manifestation of those energies, you would envision other more positive ways those energies can be brought together and made use of? Howard. Yes. With Mars square Saturn there may be a statement that my will is ineffective. But staying within the meaning of Mars and Saturn, that statement could be changed into something like, if I go slow and am cautious and persistent, then I can get there. That still fits with Mars and Saturn together. Or you could try thinking about what somebody with Mars trine Saturn might be like and that may inspire you to come up with a new statement about those same planets in square. In the end, I'm more concerned about creative and constructive ways you can bring the two energies connected by an aspect together, rather than the nature of the aspect itself, be it a square, in conjunct, trine or sextile. If you have Venus square Saturn, think about what an interpretation of Venus sextile or trine Saturn might be and that could be your alternative belief that you focus on. As long as you stick within the two archetypes involved, then you are playing within the rules, it's kosher. If you have Venus in aspect to Saturn and you try to make a statement about love and union which is Jupiterian, it's simply not in line with what the core self has in mind for you and it probably won't work. So what is an alternative statement for Venus square Saturn besides, I am unlovable, or, I don't get what I want in relationship? Think about someone with Venus trine or sextile Saturn and that might help you reformulate your statement. Keep within the confines of the principles of Venus brought together with Saturn. Audience. How about, if I work on a relationship, I can grow stronger, more loving and more loyal? Howard. Fine. But before you can get there you will have to fully experience and understand your original statement, and then you can try to shift your awareness to an alternative one. Let me take you through this in another way. Let's say a woman comes to me for a chart reading and she has the Sun conjunct Saturn in the 10th house. During the session, it comes up that she is frightened of her boss. I'm looking at her Sun conjunct Saturn in the 10th and I'm wondering if there is a deeper issue behind her fear of her boss. So I inquire, who else have you felt frightened with? And she replies, authority figures in general. We are beginning to broaden out. Then I can ask that very handy question, is this feeling of fear a familiar feeling in your life? And she answers, yes, as a child I was frightened of my mother. Then I ask her, what were you afraid of with your mother? She says, I was afraid that my mother wouldn't like me. Then I could explore further, what would have happened if she didn't like you? These kinds of questions are useful when you are working with placements in the chart psychologically. And she says, I guess I was afraid that if she didn't like me, she wouldn't look after me and then she would leave me. 
So, we have moved from feeling frightened of the boss to a fear that if mother didn't like her she would be abandoned. I could take it even further and ask, what would have happened if she left you? And she might answer, I would have died. On some deep level, her fear of the boss could be linked to unfinished business with the mother and a fear about her own survival. You see, if she came to me and told me she was frightened of her boss and I said, okay, let me do a synastry between the charts and we'll sort this out. I might do a comparison and say something like, don't be silly, you don't have to be frightened of him, you have more planets in fire than he does. And then she goes off happy and more confident about dealing with her boss. But later when she has a new job, the same problem comes up again or she finds herself frightened with other people. In other words, unless she perceives and deals with the underlying issues behind her present problem, she will just find someone else to live the pattern out with. Unless she goes deeper and starts to do something to change the basic pattern, it will just reappear in different manifestations. In a single astrology session you may only be able to start this process going, but if you are doing ongoing work with the person, you have something clear to work on. Or you can refer the person to somebody who does ongoing work. But at least we have discovered something important, her fear of not pleasing the boss is related to a fear of her mother not liking her. Everyone still has a child inside, and the child in this person is frightened that if she doesn't act the way authority figures want her to act, then she will die. Audience. It's a bit hard to make the transition correlating the male boss figure with her mother. Howard. It doesn't make any difference. The stuff around mother can be put onto anyone, husbands, bosses, or the prime minister. In any case, she is afraid of being who she is because she is afraid that if people don't like her she is going to die. But, wait a minute. She is an adult now and she can look after herself. She doesn't need to kowtow to others in order to survive. Yet, the little girl in her is still feeling that way. The priority in her case is a choice between being what other people want because that makes the child in her feel more secure, or acting in a way which is true to herself, honoring what she thinks or feels. She has Sun conjunct Saturn in the 10th and her statement is, I am afraid to be who I am. But this can easily be changed to, I must work hard to develop my identity. This is ultimately what Sun conjunct Saturn can mean, the building, Saturn, of an identity, the building of a sense of influence, power and self-sufficiency. Here is another example. Recently a woman came to see me who had Pluto in the ninth house and talked about her fear of airplanes, a fear of flying, not Erica Jong by the way. With Pluto in the ninth, what might be the deeper issue behind the fear of the airplane crashing? Audience, a fear of getting destroyed if you venture too far abroad. Howard, can you take it deeper than that? Audience, a fear that if you let go, if you venture or explore, you might be destroyed. Howard, yes, and I think on even a deeper level it is a fear of God, a mistrust of God, a belief that God is out to destroy her. Pluto has to do with destructive energy and it's in the ninth house of religion as well as travel. Now, this woman could go to a behavioral therapist and he could deal very well with her fear of airplanes. You know, he could take her a little bit each day on an airplane, first on the ground and then make her feel better that way. But the deeper pattern is still there, and ultimately it's more effective to get at the deeper issue of the mistrust of God and what that is all about. One more thing about working with patterns, and this is from Jean Houston's book The Possible Human 3. She gives a short case history of a woman she worked with called Meredith. Meredith had a very traumatic early life. Her mother put her up for adoption at birth. Then every time the mother had a new boyfriend and began to settle into some sort of home life, she would take Meredith back with her. By the age of nine, Meredith had been abused by a succession of her mother's boyfriends. She grew into an attractive woman who was terribly frightened of the world, she would shake with trauma at the thought of going out and doing things. When Meredith was 26, Jean Houston worked with her in this way. She instructed Meredith to picture herself being born, to be present at her own birth. Meredith would imagine herself being born and then visualize holding herself aged zero. So Meredith, aged 26, was imagining herself nurturing and holding Meredith, aged zero. Then Ms. Houston would ask, do you feel loved? 
And Meredith said, yes, I feel loved, and then they would work on another age. Meredith would think of another time in her childhood that she needed to be held and loved. And Jean Houston would say, okay, have Meredith aged 26 give to the younger Meredith what she needed then. Meredith would do this in her mind until at each stage she could say, yes, I feel loved. Meredith and Jean Houston worked a number of hours in this manner until the 26-year-old Meredith embraced the 26-year-old Meredith. Many years of trauma were eased in this way. Follow-up studies showed that Meredith was freer from the negative feelings of the past years. Now, you don't erase the old trauma completely in this way, but what you do is create an alternative track in the mind-brain system, you create an alternative experience to what you actually had. You keep the pathos from the past but you have created a new kind of physiology in addition to what was previously there. This new physiology can support new experiences besides the old ones you were limited to. Miss Houston calls it creating an alternative track in the mind. She says that if you do this, you also become present to the continuum of your life. Audience, and you become the possible human. Howard, well, you were more on the way there. But for Meredith it was a healing experience. Someone once said that, therapy is getting things out, but healing is getting things in. Audience, did she do things through visualization? Howard, yes. Through visualization techniques, it's possible to enter from the present time into an earlier time and enrich the reality of the earlier self in a new way. It's never too late to have a happy childhood. The three-year-old child is as alive in us right now as it was then and there is no reason why we, as we are now, can't connect to the child in us and give it the love it needs. Audience, it's funny that this all happened to Meredith at age 26 during her moon return. Howard, yes, it did, didn't it? The work was done when the progressed moon was coming back to Meredith's natal moon, when we have a chance to gather in and examine earlier events and then start off in a new direction. The phases of childhood. Let's look more closely at the stages of childhood, examining how your experience of each of these phases is shown by the chart. Earlier I explained that different archetypes are brought out at different stages of life. We'll begin right at the beginning with the prenatal experience. The central archetype of this phase is that of unity. We'll look at the placements in the chart which shed light on our relationship to this archetype and to the womb experience in general. Then we'll move on to birth and the archetype of initiation and, getting things started, and a discussion of the relationship of the ascendant to birth. From there, we'll explore what is known as the oral phase, in which the predominant drive is survival and getting our needs fulfilled. This has a lot to do with the moon. During the next phase, what is known as the anal phase, the main drive or motivation is the urge to assert the self and become more autonomous. The archetype of power is foreground during this stage, and placements involving the Sun and Mars come quite clearly into play. As psychologists have traditionally understood it and there is quite a bit of controversy about the timing of these stages, the anal phase leads on to the Oedipal stage, which is characterized by the child's desire to win the love of the opposite sex parent. The archetype activated at this time is that of union, and various placements in the chart will be brought to the fore accordingly. From there, we'll look at what is known as, the school age, or, the play age, ages 6 to 10, and wind up with a brief overview of adolescence. As we examine these various stages and their relation to the chart, please join in the discussion with any material or information you wish to add, either from a psychological or astrological angle. After all, we're talking about things we've all been through, not to mention the fact that most all of us are still trying to sort out issues left over from these early experiences. The Prenatal Experience A child's neurosis begins in the mind of the parents. This is a quote from Dr. Arthur Yanov's book The Feeling Child.4. The reasons why a woman decides she is going to have a baby will actually influence the future psychology of the child. Does she want a child because this is what society expects of her and, in actual fact, she isn't that inclined to mothering? Does she want a child because she desperately wants someone to really need her? Life experience begins in the womb. By the age of two months after conception, there is a rudimentary brain forming in the embryo, a rudimentary brain that is able to register experience. 
Therefore, even in the womb some of our inborn patterns and archetypal expectations are already being activated, fleshed out and set into motion as we register certain things that our mothers are going through. It's curious, but very often we do end up with a mother whose chart fits pretty closely the kind of mother we are expecting to get. A child with moon conjunct Pluto, for instance, may wind up with a mother who has Scorpio rising or sun or moon conjunct Pluto. Or the child with moon conjunct Pluto may be born to a mother who is going through a significant Pluto transit at the time, so the child's early, formative experience of her is colored by that planet. But, I'm diverting and we must get back to the womb. Some of you in the group may have more knowledge of fetal development than I have, so please feel free to make comments and additions. What can the chart reveal about our prenatal experience? I said earlier that archetypes express themselves through drives, and different drives are foreground at various stages of life. The archetype which is activated during the intrauterine phase is that of unity. The drive is the desire to be one with everything. Arthur Kosler talks about life in the womb, he says that, the universe is focused on the self and the self is the universe. 5. Ideally in the womb we have a sense of oceanic totality, a sense of oneness with the rest of life. Many of you have heard me speak about this before. It's something I talk about a great deal as you will know very well after studying with me. I think it's because my major drive in life is to get back there. Audience, you're not alone. Howard, yes, the thing is, the trick is, trying to find wholesome ways of getting back there. Now, if we are examining the chart to assess how we experienced life in the womb, then I would look at what is going on in the twelfth house. What is in the twelfth any planets there, the sign on the cusp, the ruling planet of the sign on the cusp and its aspects, gives clues about what our tiny, little rudimentary brain is registering via the umbilical connection to the mother. I'd also examine Neptune in the chart. How is Neptune aspected? Jupiter trine Neptune will associate the experience of unity Neptune with ease and expansion Jupiter. Saturn square Neptune may associate pain, difficulty and restriction Saturn with the archetype of unity Neptune. Issues later in life to do with various forms of mystical experiences the sense of being at one with the rest of creation will also resonate with these kinds of placements. Audience, what books do you recommend about life in the womb? Howard, there is a book by Stan Groff called The Realms of the Human Unconscious.6. He researched using LSD and putting people back into the prenatal and birth experience. Also Yanov's book The Feeling Child has a chapter on this. However, his books tend to be a hard sell on primal therapy, which he sees as an answer to everything. He is very adamant about this, he has Uranus in the twelfth. Audience, there is a very good book about the umbilical effect by Francis Mott called The Nature of the Self.7. Howard Yes, I haven't read that one yet, but Mott is well known for this work. The main thing to note about the womb experience is that we are more or less immersed in a primal paradise. What the Jungians call, Euroboric wholeness, there is no separation, it's pre-time and pre-boundaries. This is why we can associate it with boundless and formless Neptune. The womb is a kind of Eden. However, it appears that some wombs are five-star wombs, while others are four-star, three-star, two-star, etc. In the womb we register things via the mother. This is called, the umbilical effect, and the nature of what passes through the umbilical to the child is probably shown by what is in the twelfth house. For instance, if Saturn is in the twelfth, then Saturnian feelings pass from mother to developing embryo via the umbilical effect, if Jupiter is in the twelfth, then Jupiterian feelings pass through the umbilical. It's as if the twelfth house is an indication of what the mother is going through while she is pregnant. I've seen this theory work over and over again. I've never really read other astrologers on this, at least I can't remember if I ever read it or just discovered it or made it up point eight. I don't know, but it's worth bearing in mind because it seems to fit. People tell me stories about what their mothers were going through while they were in the womb and it correlates uncannily with 12th house placements. For instance, I did the chart of a woman with Saturn influencing the 12th who had access to her mother's diaries after the mother had died. In the diary, her mother wrote that she didn't want to have the child my client she was carrying. 
The mother was an artist and just didn't want a child to interfere with her creative work. Audience, have you noticed any correlation with Uranus in the 12th? Howard, yes. Very often something unexpected or disruptive happens to the mother or the family while the child with that placement is the womb, the parental marriage breaks up, the family is forced to change homes, something significant happens which brings change. Thus, the child with Uranus in the twelfth is already born with the idea in the back of his or her mind that life is unpredictable or that anything can change at a moment's notice. From then on it becomes difficult to easily settle into anything because of this vague but all-pervasive feeling that disruption is around the corner. Anything in the twelfth house is very deeply buried and free-floating. It seeps into all the various areas of our life, not just what the twelfth house represents. A man with Saturn in the twelfth, for example, may have had a difficult time in the womb and then is born with the belief in the back of his mind that life is not on his side, although nothing externally has happened to him yet to substantiate this. Also, remember that most natal placements in the twelfth will transit over the ascendant and into the first house relatively early in life, and therefore are bound to have an important influence in shaping the person's outlook. Another way to track back prenatal experience is to analyze separating aspects of the moon. Again, this is not something I've ever read in a book, so please feel free to experiment with it yourself. By using a form of converse progressions on separating aspects of the moon, I believe that you can pinpoint what month during pregnancy that certain archetypes were constellated in the fetus rudimentary awareness. Let's take an example. The moon in 9 degrees of Scorpio square Pluto in 3 degrees of Leo. This is a separating aspect because the moon moves faster than Pluto and it's moving away from the square. The moon moves roughly 1 degree a month by secondary progression and normally we count it forward. So at the age of 1 month after birth, the moon has progressed to 10 Scorpio, at 2 months after birth the moon is in 11 degrees of Scorpio, etc. But we can also do converse progressions and move the moon backward one degree for each month previous to the birth. In this case, moving the moon backward six degrees will make it three degrees and exactly square Pluto in three Leo, and this would have occurred six months before birth or three months after conception. In other words, using this system, the converse moon ran up against Pluto in the third month after conception. Therefore, at the time, the developing embryo would have encountered something plutonic through the moon mother. Later in life, whenever a transit comes along and touches off the natal moon Pluto square, it may reactivate the same pattern that was first brought out the third month after conception. Again, the important question to ask is, how is this pattern operating in your life now? And if it is there now, is it in a form which is consistent with what you want in your life? If it isn't in accord with what you want, then what are some alternative statements that could be derived from this kind of aspect? Yanov reported a few experiments which were done on pregnant rats who were exposed to loud noises. These rats produced smaller offspring than the ones who weren't. This suggests that stress or fear in the pregnant mother has an effect on the offspring. A loud noise and the accompanying reaction of fear produced hormonal changes in the rat mothers which then affected the embryo's development. Stress increases the mother's heart rate and thereby increases the fetus heart rate. The mother's heartbeat has a profound effect on the fetus. The fetus can actually hear the mother's heartbeat. It has been proven that the fetus can hear noises and if the mother's heartbeat is irregular it is not very reassuring for the embryo. So, already in the womb, the person doesn't feel very assured about life. I wonder if someone with Uranus in the twelfth had a mother with an irregular heartbeat. Audience, when you are lying in the bath, and I do this sometimes, and you put your head down under the water and your ears are underwater, you hear your heartbeat. I should think it's very much the same as being in the womb and hearing your mother's heartbeat. Audience, there is a fantastic recording made by the Japanese of what the fetus hears in the uterus. It's the most moving thing because the heartbeat is tremendously powerful, and you also have the swishing of the blood through the aorta. It's so beautiful. Howard, yes, rhythm is so important. Audience, it's very soothing for a baby too. I mean you play this recording to them and they shut up. Howard, yes, I read of an experiment in a ward in Thailand where there were 400 women and their babies. They played this type of recording and the ward was ever so silent, just the sound of this music playing. 
we might ask what kinds of rhythms the developing fetus responded to in the womb, and there could be a connection between the plantar sign in the twelfth and the nature of the mother's heartbeat and her rhythms. Aspects the converse moon makes to natal planets could also shed some light here. Audience, what about Jupiter in the twelfth? Howard, I've always imagined that those with Jupiter in the twelfth must have felt pretty good in the womb, except that you will have to take into account any aspects to Jupiter. On the whole, later in life these people have an underlying faith in life, a kind of basic optimism. They may even find themselves in very tricky or dangerous situations and yet manage to escape in the nick of time, like Indiana Jones in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Audience, what about Neptune there? Howard, if Neptune was well aspected, then it would be a five-star womb, the Ritz of Wombs. That's why so many people with Neptune in the twelfth give me the feeling that they never really wanted to be born in the first place. Why leave that paradise to come into the harsh world of form and separateness? Audience, I've got Uranus in the twelfth and I find it very interesting in light of what you say. While my mother was pregnant with me, it was wartime and we had to be evacuated. My mother was very disoriented. I'm sure I picked up on that. Howard, yes, in the womb and right through very early childhood, mother is the whole world to us. What she goes through is what we go through. At some point we may need to separate or squeeze out just how much of what we are carrying is our stuff and how much is what we have taken on through the mother. Audience, what about the south node of the moon in the twelfth? Howard, many believe that the south node indicates the path of least resistance. In the twelfth, the person may exhibit a strong regressive tendency, wanting to stay blended and merged with others rather than coming out and developing the self as a unique and separate individual. The north node would be in the sixth and the conflict is between the twelfth house urge to stay in the embrace of the great mother, the urge to be swallowed up and identified with something greater than the self, as opposed to the sixth house concern of finding those particular characteristics which make you distinct from everything else. In my book The Twelve Houses Nine I discuss in depth the significance of all the different planets and signs in the Twelfth House. Audience, while we are still on the Twelfth House stuff, I read about another experiment with pregnant rats. Pregnant rats who were stroked during pregnancy produced a greater number of surviving offspring than those rats' mother who were not touched. Howard so, there is the idea that the mother who is stroked and loved during pregnancy produces a baby with a greater chance of survival. A nicely aspected Venus in the twelfth maybe. Have you noticed we are all getting stuck in this womb phase right now? Let's move on to birth. The archetype of birth. The archetype constellated at birth is that of initiation, how we get things started. We are already born with an image of what it is going to be like whenever we have to get something started. The actual birth serves to activate that innate image. The actual physical birth adds a layer of substance to the inborn image of the birth archetype. Later on in life, any time we have to begin something new or move into a new phase of life, our original pattern around birth along with all its subsequent layering will come up again. The sign on the ascendant reflects our inborn image of the birth archetype. I would also examine the ruler of the ascendant and what that planet is up to by sign, house and aspect. Any planets closely aspecting the Ascendant are also activated at birth. These all give you clues about the person's birth experience as well as how one approaches any new phase of life or major new undertaking. The placement of Mars, by sign and aspect, should also shed some light in this respect. Birth really means taking on a body and it heralds the beginning of life as a separate individual. The body is a boundary which distinguishes us from others. Actually, even for the first six to nine months of life after birth, we still don't really, twig, that we are a separate entity. This phase is called, primary narcissism, the feeling that everything around us is just an extension of who we are. According to the most recent psychological thought, an infant needs to have this experience of being the center of everything. In other words, the baby shouldn't be jolted out of the non-differentiated environment of the womb into a sense of separateness too quickly or suddenly. The first six to nine months of life should be a gradual adjustment to the idea that we are separate and distinct. During those early months of life, the child can't be loved or nurtured enough. 
Then, gradually, the child begins to acknowledge and recognize its separateness and can tolerate more frustration and greater independence. Many books about raising children written in the 1940s and 1950s didn't advocate this. Rather, it was advised that the baby should be made to adjust to the mother's routine. It was believed that the baby should be fed only according to a strict schedule and not just because it was screaming. The advice was to let the baby scream. The result is that we have a whole generation of people who grew up and are still running around trying to find ways to reconnect to that sense of unity from which they were too quickly jolted. This is the pathology that arises from having to experience separateness too early in life. You are left craving for that unity which you were forced to relinquish too soon. Later in life, you are constantly looking for that person or thing which will fit perfectly with you and make you whole again. As a general rule, if you don't get what you need at any stage of early life, there is always the tendency to want to go back there again in order to finish it up properly. Conversely, a pathology arises if this phase of primary narcissism goes on too long, if the mother is over-adapted to the child's needs beyond the first year and a half of life or so. In this case, you don't learn to acknowledge your separateness and then later on don't have the mechanisms to cope with life not being exactly as you want it just when you want it. You expect instant fulfillment of your desires because your mother always made sure of that. You expect everyone to adjust to you. You can't cope with the otherness of other people. This is why the English pediatrician, Winnicott, talked about the good enough mother. 10. If the mother tries to be too perfect and overly adapted to the child for too long, the child doesn't learn how to deal with frustration and is not well equipped for the realities of everyday life. But more about this latter. Let's go back to the birth experience itself. It's worth inquiring into what your actual birth was like. This will reveal a great deal about your patterning around the archetype of initiation and getting things started. Remember, it is not necessarily what happens at your birth which causes you to have certain patterns, it's more the other way around, your innate patterning and a priori expectation around the archetype of birth influences what your actual birth experience is like. The Ascendant An idea I had recently, and which I'm finding very useful in chart readings, is considering the Ascendant as the way we hatch, the different ways a bird might peck itself out of an egg. How would an Aries rising bird peck itself out? How would a Taurus rising bird peck itself out? This will not only describe something about how you are born, but also what happens whenever you are getting something new going or entering a new phase of life. An Aries rising bird will rush headlong into hatching, it just goes for it and in one fell swoop cracks the egg and appears onto the scene, bang, like that. Of course, if Mars the ruler of Aries is square Pluto, then it may go through some degree of torture and strain before marching out. What about the Taurus rising bird? Audience, I think it will spend a lot of time looking out the window first to see if it is safe to make a move. Howard, yes, it will wait as long as it can before making the change, but when it senses it has to be done, it will be very determined, no stopping it. What about a Gemini rising bird? Audience, it pecks here and there all over the egg, or it starts to peck and then gets diverted into something else. Or it begins to think about whether it should do it at all and explores all the reasons why it should or shouldn't. Howard, yes, the Gemini rising bird may want to read up on the nature of pecking out before it does it, or maybe discuss the prospect with other birds in the neighborhood first. I've noticed that people with air signs on the Ascendant like to find out as much as they can about something before going into it. People with Aquarius rising, for instance, require some sort of conceptual understanding of the whys and wherefores of something before they take action. Taurus rising, on the other hand, responds to a physical pressure, an organic, biological urge to make a move. Cancer rising birds feel the need to peck themselves out or make a move. The Cancer Rising Bird is another one that starts to peck and then hesitates, thinking, I actually prefer the space I already know, and goes back in. But it doesn't feel comfortable staying there and starts to peck itself out again. Leo Rising Birds often wait until the moment is best to make a dramatic entrance and then burst proudly onto the scene. A Virgo Rising Bird will want to hatch into a new phase neatly, pecking a little then tidying up, pecking a bit more and then tidying up again. 
Virgo rising has a fear that it is not going to do it well enough, that's why it tries to do it so right. A Libra rising bird will want to approach birth or any new phase of experience in a beautiful way, to do it with style and taste. Being an air sign, it will want to make sure there are sound justifications for why this has to happen and then proceeds in a way that's fair, at least fair from its own perspective. Or the Libra rising bird may provoke other people into forcing it to change or act, in that way it can abnegate personal responsibility for the action. As you move into the second half of the zodiac, there's more of a tendency to create situations which require you to change rather than just directly changing because that is what suits you. Audience, next time you do some of the signs will you pick some from the second half? Howard, all right, I don't want to be a bad mother. Let's finish them off. What about a Scorpio rising birth? Audience, the birth may entail a life and death struggle. Howard, yes, many people with Scorpio rising or Pluto near the ascendant have reported to me that they are their mothers nearly died at birth. Scorpio rising birds seem to set up dramatic situations which require that they grow and change or else they might die or at least remain very miserable. Sagittarius rising is usually keen to get on with any new phase or venture, oh boy, what's waiting around the corner? Usually Sagittarius rising will justify the change from some sort of philosophical basis. Or, having taken an overview of the situation, they deem it the right action to make. Capricorn rising usually resists change, oh god, do I really have to go through with this, it's such an effort, but I know I should. Capricorn may balk at the whole prospect right up until the last moment still wondering if it's the right thing to do, until it finally gives in. I've already mentioned Aquarius. A Pisces rising bird will probably prefer to stay in the egg, unless someone else entices it out or asks it to move. Pisces rising people are coerced into new phases or coerced into action if they feel that someone or something needs them to do it. Audience, what about the early or late births or caesareans? Howard, from the charts I have seen, Uranus on or aspecting the ascendant may describe something unusual about the birth. Uranus or Jupiter near the ascendant could also mean someone who is in a hurry to get out. In a few cases I have seen with Mercury on the ascendant, the person was born while the mother was still in transit to the hospital. Some caesareans appear to have a correlation with Mars or Pluto around the ascendant or aspecting it, these planets have to do with surgery. But, honestly, I haven't undertaken any legitimate research into these things. What I am telling you is what I have observed in my 15 years of doing charts. It is worth thinking about these kinds of births from a purely psychological point of view. In one study about early births, it was shown that these people grew up with a longing for permanence and a panic at change, because change had come too soon to them. Some of those who had delayed births may have had the feeling that the mother was holding them back from being born. Very often, the child has projected his or her reluctance to be born onto the mother. The mother is felt to be the one who is holding back or trapping the child, but more often than not these people later exhibit a pattern of holding themselves back or trapping themselves in tight corners. Regarding caesarean births, Yaniv felt that these people were deprived of something important. During a natural birth there are contractions, but the caesarean doesn't have this experience. Contractions are important because these movements stimulate the skin of the baby. You know how animals lick the skin of their newborn. They lick their offspring in order to stimulate the skin, which in turn activates the bowels and bladder into action. This is why touch is so important to us in the beginning of life, being touched literally stimulates organs into action. It's like being massaged. You might be constipated and then you have a good massage and you are off in an instant. Caesareans may also go though life with the sense that something big is just about to happen, because they were deprived of the full birth experience and they are still expecting it. Audience, you know how you were talking about Pluto on the ascendant as possibly signifying a traumatic birth. I know a man who is an Aries with Pluto on the ascendant in Leo opposing the Moon and Mars in Aquarius. His mother was Polish and they were escaping from the advancing Russians when she gave birth. Audience, could you say something about induced births? Howard, this is a big issue in astrology. I tend to think that we come out when we are meant to come out. 
If we are induced, then for some reason it has been computed by the self to get you out then. Audience. I did a sinistry for a mother and her three children and I found that she had a particularly strong link with her firstborn who was a boy. When I mentioned this she said, that's strange. He was the only one who was induced, because I didn't know any better. And yet, he was the one whose chart had the closest links to hers. Howard, that reminds me of a case I came across not long ago. It was the chart of a baby girl whose mother was diagnosed as having a brain tumor while she was pregnant with this child. The doctors decided to induce the birth because they were really very worried whether the mother was going to live for very long. They brought the birth forward. It turned out that the time they chose to induce the child happened to be the exact hour in which the nearly total eclipse of the sun happened in Gemini this year, 1984. Can you imagine, picking out a time to induce a child and just happening to arrange it at the hour of an eclipse? What happened is that they were wheeling the mother into the operating theater in order to carry out the induction when suddenly the child popped out of its own accord before they even got to the operating room. It just came out right there and then anyway. Sadly, the mother died three days later. The baby girl has Pluto in the 12th in 29 degrees of Libra and Scorpio rising. Pluto in the 12th fits with what we have been saying about the child's experience of what the mother was going through during the pregnancy, I mean, the mother found out she was going to die. And the Scorpio ascendant with Pluto in the 12th nearby would suggest the dramatic and rather disturbing situation surrounding the birth itself, not to mention the eclipse. I tend to think that there is some great computer in the sky which takes all these things into account, even induced births. We must push on. Now that we are born, the next phase is the oral phase. I'd like to finish the oral phase in time for lunch. Then we can do the anal phase while we are digesting our food. The oral phase. Archetypes come through drives and drives express themselves through various organs in the body. Different organs are activated at different times in the early stages of childhood. In the oral phase, from birth until age 2, we relate to the world primarily through the mouth and the activity of sucking. I also think that the skin is important in the oral stage, being touched, stroked and held is crucial in this early period. Harlow's experiments with monkeys showed this point one one. Some monkeys were kept in a cage with a wire mother while others were put in a cage with a cloth mother. Both the wire and the cloth mothers were equipped to feed the monkeys, so feeding wasn't the issue, touch was the critical factor. The monkeys with the cloth mother grew up less frightened of the world and new experience than the monkeys reared by the wire mother. The fact that they could snuggle up close to the cloth mother fostered better relationships later in life. Then Harlow used, sock mothers. The experimenters worked out some way to heat the sock. They found that the heated sock mothers produced better adjusted offspring than the unheated sock mothers. The mothers that provided both a soft touch and warmth were the best of all. The archetypal principles which are important in the oral phase are love, nurturance and survival. According to the psychologist Eric Erickson, 12 the main issue of this phase is the development of basic trust versus mistrust. The big question is, am I going to make it? The moon is the main astrological principle which is activated during this state, although placements in the first, fourth and tenth houses as well as any Taurus or Cancer emphasis also come into consideration. Placements and aspects in the chart which relate to love and nurturance will be activated. During the first two years of life, we form opinions about how safe the world is for us, how good a place it is. Mother is really the whole world to the child during this time. If mother is a safe container and can provide the baby with what it needs, then the baby will form an opinion that, life will provide me with what I need, the world is a safe place for me. This forms the basis of what Erickson calls abiding hope or trust. But if mother neglects the baby or isn't sensitive to the baby's needs, if she is too depriving, or if she is a, stuffing, type mother, then the baby may form the opinion that life is not so conducive to its survival. Erickson calls this basic mistrust point one three. Furthermore, if the baby is hungry and mother doesn't come, or if it needs to be held in a certain way and mother's hold is too tight or too loose, then the baby begins to think, what's wrong with me? I must be bad, one can't even get my needs fulfilled. Melanie Klein 14 referred to this as interjecting the bad mother or the bad breast. 
Obviously, such a situation doesn't do much for the infant's self-image later in life. Another big question that arises during this period is, what do I have to do to get nourishment and love? Do I have to keep still to get fed or held? Do I have to assert to get fed? Do I have to scream my head off to get love? Do I have to be good and well-behaved to win what I need? These kinds of life statements are brought to the surface in the oral phase. Let's focus in on the moon and see what kinds of life statements and what kinds of experience correlate with different aspects to the moon. Remember that the planet that aspects the moon will indicate something about our experience of the mother, those things she does which register with us. Audience, I had to stop breastfeeding at 7 weeks because I had blocked milk ducts. My daughter has the moon in 7 Libra opposite Saturn in 9 Aries. We were living in the middle of the African bush then and I only had one bottle. Howard, you see, around the age of two months, your daughter's moon progressed from seven to nine Libra and exactly opposed her Saturn. So her experience of you, her mother, was colored by the principle of Saturn. In this case you were the perfect reflection of this. Your milk, her source of sustenance, the moon, was blocked, Saturn. Even if your milk hadn't been blocked she probably would have experienced something of a Saturnian nature via you during that time. Later on, based on that experience and possible other things, your daughter may not feel that the world is a very safe place for her. Audience, well, she is a raging punk now, shocking colored hair and all. For a while she tried to dress conventionally in order to find a job. She didn't get a job so she went back to being punk. She really does believe that the world is against her. Howard, patterns from childhood often re-emerge full-fledged at adolescence. I'll be talking more about this later. Sometimes, we have a chance to redeem negative childhood patterns during adolescence. For instance, if your daughter finds a close female friend who positively satisfies some of her emotional needs, this may heal some of the early wounds. Audience, what about Moon Uranus aspects? Howard, let's look at the hard aspects first. The child is born with an inner image of mother as erratic, inconsistent, or unpredictable. The mother may actually be like that, or the child with this aspect is predisposed to notice when she is acting that way rather than in other ways. When I put the archetype of the Moon together with the principle of Uranus, I think of a mother who might not be that comfortable with the maternal role. The traditional moon mother is the earth mother. However, if Uranus touches something then it will bring out the less conventional sides of the archetype or principle it aspects. Therefore, the mother may not have been experienced as a traditional maternal type mother. Perhaps she was someone more like Athene, the goddess of cool wisdom. Or more like Artemis, the huntress, who was a virgin. Many people with Moon Uranus aspects have reported to me that they felt their mothers would have liked to be doing something else rather than being at home changing nappies and washing dishes. The picture I have of a Moon Uranus mother is someone holding and feeding the child but her mind is off somewhere else. She is thinking about the future, or other things she might be doing, or of something she saw on television. The child is being held and fed and yet the mother is not really totally tangible and present. The child will sense the mother's lack of presence. It confuses the child who is left unsure if it can rely on the mother. If the mother is an unknown quantity, then the whole world feels very uncertain. The child feels that the mother is not in tune with its needs, and then later on the child grows up feeling out of tune with the world. Think about it. Think about what an inconsistent mother is like for the child. For instance, let's say that one day the child smiles and puts out his hand and his mother picks him up. So he thinks, okay, when I smile and put out my hand, then mother will pick me up. The next day he smiles and puts out his hand and his mother doesn't pick him up. So he thinks, well maybe it's every other time I smile and put out my hand that she picks me up. Children with the moon in aspect to Uranus become very inventive in an attempt to fit the unpredictable mother into some sort of logical equation. They are good at organizing diverse information into systems. Perhaps moon Uranus people grow up highly original, inventive and independent because they never really felt they could totally rely on their mothers to do things for them. 
some with this aspect will grow up restless and unpredictable themselves, and a step ahead of everyone else. Later in life, men with this aspect are often attracted to women who are not maternal types. Now if these men have something like Venus conjunct Saturn, Capricorn on the seventh house cusp and moon square Uranus, there is a lot of confusion. The Saturnian and Capricorn side is looking for a partner who is conventional, while the moon square Uranus indicates an attraction for women of an Uranian nature, who reflect a side of the man's nature which is not that suited to conventional forms of domesticity. Often I have seen moon Uranus aspects corresponding to a change of home in the early environment. For instance, if the moon is 2 degrees Cancer and Uranus is 6 degrees Libra, then by secondary progression the progressed moon squares Uranus at the age of 4 months. And you find out that at age 4 months the family moved or something disruptive occurred in the home environment. The newly born infant is just settling into the home and it is all disrupted. The statement that arises from this is, I can't settle into anything. The moon wants to settle and is seeking security and containment, while Uranus is saying, just you try and get comfortable and I'll change it all on you. Later, the person has trouble settling into one thing for very long because the archetype of containment, the moon, is connected to the archetype of change and disruption, Uranus. A woman with moon in aspect to Uranus who has children often relates to them better as the children grow older. She can detach herself from strictly maternal feelings and talk objectively with a child. Taking objectively to a six-month-old infant who is wet or hungry doesn't mean much. Audience, how can moon Uranus aspects express positively? Howard, a child with moon sextile or trine Uranus may have a mother who models originality and individualistic thinking and behavior to the child. If it is a girl child, she grows up thinking, I can be a woman but I don't have to be conventional, I can still do my own thing. If it is a boy child, he grows up liking women who are individuals in their own right and there may be no problems for him about this. Also, remember that if a mother totally represses her Uranian side, then a child with a moon Uranus aspect is likely to grow up and live out the mother's unexpressed urges to be different and unconventional. Audience what about the moon in aspect to Pluto? Howard, moon Pluto aspects may be similar to Pluto in the 10th house if you take the 10th to correspond to mother moon in Scorpio or even the moon in the 8th. Astrology is a language in which things can be expressed in many different ways. In this case, we have to connect up the principle of the moon with that of Pluto. I'm sure you have heard Liz talk about this one, but let me recapitulate it. The image of mother may be dark or negative, not always, but we'll talk about the positive moon Pluto image in a minute. There could be a sense that your mother is not conducive or attuned to your needs and even a feeling that she is out to destroy you. She is seen as suffocating, devouring and threatening. Not that she actually beats you or feeds you nails but she feels dangerous. She may be suffocating and overly clinging, holding you too tight or you will be especially receptive to her dark moods and her depressions, or something unpleasant seething inside her. The moon is what we take in, what we drink in from the early environment. Moon in aspect to Pluto will be receptive to what is Plutonic in the environment. This is usually mediated via the mother, but it can come through anyone in the house, such as an aunt, nanny, or a sister. Recently I did a chart for a woman with the moon at 1 degree Scorpio and Pluto 2 degrees Leo. At the age of 1 month, the progressed moon came into an exact square to Pluto. Therefore, there is the suggestion that at this time the child would have picked up on something plutonic in the atmosphere. In this case, it turned out the mother suffered a severe postnatal depression and wanted to reject the new baby. And remember, any time later in life when a transit comes to the first few degrees of a fixed sign, it will trigger that natal aspect and may reactivate some of the feelings that were there in her when she was just one month old, that same sense of anger, fear, frustration, and terror which she must have experienced when the mother was so depressed and rejecting. In addition, this woman would also have been left with a feeling that she was bad, otherwise why would mother reject her? You can see why this aspect suggests that there is a great deal of emotional house cleaning to do. This reminds me of one woman I worked with over a few years who had moon square Pluto. 
I took her through a rebirthing exercise in which she relived her birth and then had her imagine she was being put onto her mother's breast. She screamed out how disgusting it was and that she wanted to vomit. Any aspects of the moon can be projected onto the breast. In this case, she envisioned the breast as full of poison, a plutonic breast. This woman grew up very concerned with matters of diet and health and ways of improving the body. In a woman's chart, the moon may also indicate the way in which she relates to her own body. The mother is the first role model of the feminine. What she saw in the mother are projected onto the mother is something she must look for and do something about in herself. Audience, what is a positive moon Pluto image? Howard, I'm thinking of a few cases in which the person had moon in aspect to Pluto, the trine, sextile and even a square and the mother had cancer or some life-threatening illness while the child was still small. What happened in these cases is that the mother survived the crisis and beat the cancer. So the image of the mother is someone who can be transformed in a positive way through a crisis, an image of being able to endure something negative and yet rise out of the ashes to new life again. The mother was seen to fall apart and yet put herself back together again, and this modeled to the child the ability to do this for him or herself later in life, like in the movie Alive doesn't live here anymore. Life is disrupted and the mother does rebuild. Audience, can you do Moon Neptune? Howard, that's another juicy one, isn't it? The mother gets caught up with Neptune, the child is sensitive to what is Neptunian about the mother. The image of mother as a victim or a martyr comes to mind. This might also be seen by Neptune in the 10th if you take the 10th to mean mother Pisces on the cusp of the 10th or the moon in the 12th house. In certain cases I have seen, the mother has given up an artistic or creative career to become a parent. Or the mother was afraid to commit herself to the challenges of a career as a singer or dancer and having children opened up another avenue. But still the mother emanates that, look what I have sacrificed for you, feeling. All children are sensitive to their mothers, but those with moon in aspect to Neptune are uncannily attuned to her. They don't even have to be in the same room and yet they feel what the mother is going through. If the mother has pain, the moon Neptune child experiences that pain as if it were his or her own. Sometimes, they may even feel responsible for the mother's pain, as if they had caused it. In short, moon Neptune aspects give a problem with boundaries. Those with these placements don't know where they end and others begin. They take on the feelings and needs of others and grow into adults who suffer a lot, or they become people who repeatedly rescue others. The tendency for those with moon Neptune aspects is to feel that everything is somehow related or connected to them. Because in the womb we all had, to some degree, a sense of oneness with the rest of life, we retain a memory that on some deep level we are connected to everything. Mystics speak about reconnecting to this universal self. Children have a memory of the interconnectivity of all life. If something happens, out there, they feel they have something to do with that, and perhaps even that they caused it. This happened in the movie Kramer vs. Kramer, where the little boy believed that his mother left because he had been bad. Once a little girl told me that her daddy left home because she wasn't pretty enough. As children, we also believe that thinking or wishing something is the same as actually doing the deed. If, as children, we have a negative thought about mother and then the next day she falls ill, we think we have caused that to happen to her. Those with moon Neptune aspects will especially feel guilty in this way, thinking that somehow they are responsible for everything bad that happens around them. It's a kind of magical thinking. As a result, they feel guilty and bad about themselves and don't grow up with a very positive self-image. Or else they have a confused self-image because they are like vacuum cleaners, absorbing so much from the environment they don't know who they are in themselves. Audience, Howard, I have moon in aspect to Neptune and I tend to feel hurt when I should actually feel angry. Howard, do you feel guilty about getting angry? Audience, right, that's true. Howard, as I was saying, Moon Neptune has problems with boundaries, and the difficulty with not having clear boundaries is that it's hard to stand up for yourself. Because who are you anyway? You can be so sensitive to why another person is being a certain way that you wind up actually commiserating with the person who is making you angry. Moon Neptune indicates the burden of being an extra sensitive person. Of course, that can be rather fun in a theatrical kind of way, 
everything becomes so meaningful and, too, too much. In certain cases, people with Moon-Neptune contacts can be a bit too precious. At the same time, they are often hurt and disappointed because life fails to live up to their dreams. The Moon is what we take in, what we drink in from what is around us. If you want to drink Neptune from the environment, you are looking for angels and birds singing in heavenly trumpets, or Julie Andrews on some mountain in Austria, or Richard Gere to sweep you away to a desert island. You don't want fragmentation, pain, and disharmony, you want to merge and blend and be whole again. It's called, divine homesickness. When the world is harsh, cruel, and nasty, Moon Neptune is truly disappointed. It's interesting that many people with these aspects often end up working in hospitals and institutions to help those who are limited or afflicted in some way. It is as if part of them is trying to make the world a little bit more ideal, or part of them can truly identify with those society calls the underdog. Meanwhile, all the time there is this yearning to be back in that place where everything is celestial, ideal and fits perfectly. Audience I get to the point where I feel I must arouse my anger, and then I'm worried about hurting the other person. Howard, yes, this is what I mean about the burden of being an extra-sensitive person. Moon Neptune people may be so understanding and accepting of another person that any angry part is shoved under the carpet. At some point they may have to contact and release that anger or sense of injustice, but usually they come back to trying to be understanding and accepting again. Often, this can facilitate a kind of healing for the other person involved, who thinks, I've really hurt her and yet she still accepts me. Sometimes, that kind of acceptance helps to melt another person's hardness and rigidity. At other times, however, it might drive the other person crazy because he can't get a straightforward, dynamic, gutsy response from you. Or you end up being their doormat. The moon in aspect to Neptune may also ask that we sacrifice the personal mother in some way. Maybe she has to work during the day to make ends meet, so we are forced at a young age to sacrifice her, to give her back to the world. I've seen this aspect in the charts of a few people whose parents ran pubs. The pub is the child's home and yet even within the home they have to watch the mother serving and paying attention to others. Audience I have Moon in aspect to Neptune and my mother was a Sagittarius with Moon in Pisces. It was a difficult marriage and she sacrificed going to university and getting a degree in order to be a mother. Howard, in this case she came from her Moon in Pisces and didn't live out the Sun in Sagittarius, the sign of higher learning. And here you are today studying astrology and psychology. Okay, we have to break for lunch. We are not done with the oral phase yet, but lunch can be a practical experience of it. Notice what you have to do to get fed. Need, love and hate. We'll continue with further developments in the oral phase. Basically, the inner world of the child consists of three factors, need, love and hate. As children, we are incredibly needy. If mother is good enough and feeds us and holds us in the way we need, then we feel tremendous love for her. Invariably, it will happen that even the best mother will mess up or frustrate us and then we feel fear and rage, after all, our life depends on her doing her job right. Look at it this way. In the womb, everything was more or less there as you needed it. After birth and as you grow a little older, you begin to realize that mother is actually not the same person as you, she is different and separate from you. This is very scary. If she is different from you, she may not always be in tune with you. She has feelings and moods of her own and these may not always gel with what you want and need. Because you are so dependent on her for your survival, you become frightened and enraged when she isn't there in the way you need her, and you hate her. You want to kill her. This is your primordial, instinctive, infantile rage, the stuff that Pluto and nightmares are made of. I'll be speaking more about this in the aggression seminar, but we are touching on what Melanie Klein referred to as, splitting. 15. The child actually, splits, the mother into two different people, the good mother or good breast and the bad mother or bad breast. You love and adore the good mother, the one who was there when you need her, and you hate and despise and want to destroy the bad mother, the one who doesn't respond as you require. Splitting the mother into two makes it safe to do this, because if you fantasize destroying the bad mother, then you still have the good one left. 
You can express hostility and rage at the bad mother because she is not the same person as the good mother. You can destroy the bad mother in your mind and yet still keep the good mother intact. Do you recognize this from fairy tales? The wicked stepmother and the real mother who is actually a princess. According to many psychologists, splitting occurs up to the age of 18 months. Ideally, by that time you are meant to realize that the mother who is the good mother and who comes when you need her is the same as the mother who sometimes messes up. Therefore, you come to see that mother contains both good and bad. Then you begin to think, well, I should temper some of my hatred towards the bad mother because she is also the same as the good one I need. This is how you learn to accept that another person can be both good and bad. If you don't succeed in resolving the split, it can be quite pathological later in life. In this case, if you are with somebody and he or she is not fitting with you properly or giving you what you want, be it your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, boss or teacher, then you may start to see this person as all bad. And if he or she is all bad, then you have every justification to unleash all your hatred, destructiveness and anger and you don't feel as if you are destroying anything good. You might notice some regression to the splitting stage when you have a fight with your lover and suddenly you have an image of this person as wicked and out to destroy you because he or she is not being what you want. You lose sight of anything good in your lover, or anything good in the relationship. I wonder if the psychopathology of someone like Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper who murdered all those women, isn't mixed up with something unresolved around splitting. When he was killing his female victims, he was seeing them as all bad, and in his twisted mind he wasn't killing anything with any good in it. Resolving splitting means finding that place in yourself where you can accept another person as being both good and bad, and accepting that any relationship will also be a mixture of both good and bad factors. I am finding that people with a strong emphasis of mutability in their charts may have some difficulty resolving splitting, especially if the moon has variable aspects to it. For instance, the moon in Gemini already has a tendency to have a dual image of the mother. I'm thinking of a chart I did recently for a woman with the moon conjunct Uranus in Gemini trine Jupiter in Libra but square Mars in Virgo. During the reading, she was receptive, open, and appreciative of what we were discussing. Then a few days later, I received a letter from her and she was in a rage, the reading was a lot of bunk, astrology was a lot of bunk and I was a lot of bunk. Words to those effect. So during the reading, everything was all good and then later on it was all bad. When I spoke to her later on the phone, there was nothing I could say which was acceptable, not even, hello, absolutely nothing. Problems with splitting can also occur if the moon has mixed aspects. For instance, I know a woman with moon conjunct Jupiter square Pluto. When her lover is being good, she sees him as the most magnificent man to ever grace the earth the moon Jupiter feelings. When he doesn't fit her exactly, he then becomes totally and completely vile in her eyes moon square Pluto. Or a person may have moon trine Neptune but also square Mars. Then there is a tendency to shift from being all appreciative moon trine Neptune to all angry moon square Mars. Persecutory and depressive anxiety. Melanie Klein also talked about two different kinds of anxiety which the young infant suffers which are related to the splitting phase point 1-6. First there is, persecutory anxiety, which is the feeling that there is something out there which is going to destroy you. However, in most cases the child is actually projecting his or her own badness and destructiveness onto the environment. Eventually there is a shift from persecutory anxiety to what is called, Depressive anxiety, the fear that you might destroy that which you love. Depressive anxiety is actually very healthy, because it inhibits us from blindly acting out all our negative impulses. When children are at the point of experiencing depressive anxiety, it is a signal that they are beginning to see that mother is both good and bad. Then they start to make reparations. That is, if they feel negative and hostile to the mother one day, they will try to make up for it by being extra nice the next day. In this way they reduce the anxiety that they might destroy the one they love and need. How many of us still operate in this way in our adult life? I've noticed it often in myself as well as in my therapy clients. In the process of therapy, clients may project something onto me because I'm not giving them everything they need. I'm thinking of one woman in particular who started to see me in a bad light. 
In one session she verbally attacked me for being no good and for not making everything better for her right away. She was angry with me for not telling her exactly what she should do with her life. The next session after that she brought me a bunch of flowers, as if to make reparations because she was afraid I might have been destroyed by what she said, or that I might want to stop working with her. It was important for her that I was still there even after she had been angry at me. Through this she was learning that she could have negative feelings and it was still alright. Similarly, it is important for mothers to be able to let their children experiment with the whole range of feelings which are coming up in them during the splitting phase and the time of persecutory and depressive anxiety. This means giving the child an invitation to experiment with emotions rather than being a mother who reacts to the child's feelings in an overly subjective way. I've definitely observed some astrological correlations here. People with the Moon in hard aspect to Mars, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune or Pluto may still harbor a deep fear that they will destroy or lose those they love. They may have, way in the back of their minds, the idea that if they love something they will destroy it. It could be that as children they felt angry towards the mother and then the next day she fell ill or had to go away for some reason, and the children are left thinking that they have caused that. Or sometimes this pattern is there for children who have been breastfed and then for some reason they lose the breast, the milk dries up or the mother becomes ill. These children may be left feeling that their greed exhausted the breast. Later in life, they still have a nebulous fear that those they love will die, or leave them, or be driven away. If we have a statement or pattern like that, then very often we unconsciously make it come true. The nature of a complex is to try to prove itself true. Becoming aware of these complexes helps us to change them. We are dominated by anything we are unconscious of in ourselves. The chart can make us more aware of some of these issues and then we can begin to explore them and work with them, and allow for other alternatives as I've explained earlier in the seminar. The issue of survival. Survival is really the key issue during this oral phase. The early bonding relationship with the mother is very much based on the belief that, I need you to love me to survive. In infancy this is true. We are all born potential victims, unless there is someone bigger and more mature to look after us, there is a good chance we will die. What happens, though, is that the infant in us the child in the adult often still feels this way in later adult relationships when the issue really isn't survival at all. A close intimate relationship in adult life will reawaken unfinished business and patterns from the first all-important bonding situation with the mother or caretaker. Later in life you are in a relationship with someone and that person threatens to leave you or plays around with somebody else and you think, I'll die if you leave me, or, I can't live without you. This isn't true, you are an adult now and you don't need someone else to love you or to be there in order to survive. But the child inside you is still thinking this, still feeling this on a deep primal level. Therefore, it's very hard for us to be really cool, detached, and objective in our most intimate relationships. Too many anxieties, ghosts and fears from our earlier life as a helpless infant are stirred up. Astrologically, what I am talking about now can be clearly seen if there are squares from the 4th or 10th houses to the 7th or 8th houses. With such squares, parental issues the meridian axis are obviously interfering with partnership issues the 7th and 8th. However, projecting unfinished parental stuff onto close partners is so universal it can hardly be pinned down to one placement or aspect. The closer we become to someone, the more likely we will start seeing them as mother. In this respect, it is also worth considering the theory of Dr. Bowlby, another English psychiatrist.17. Bowlby wrote about our pressing need to feel special to mother. Centuries of evolution have ingrained into our species the belief that if mother finds you very special, she will want to keep you alive. Smiling alluringly at her, enchanting her, and captivating her are ways of making sure she likes you. If she likes you, then she will stay by you and protect you in case any hairy predators come along to eat you up. So, later in life you are in a relationship but the child in you is still thinking that in order to survive you must be the most special thing to this person. If the person you are involved with starts flirting with someone else or has a job, hobby, or preoccupation which diverts him or her, the primitive part of your brain becomes agitated and starts to ruminate, I'm going to die if I'm not the most special thing to this person. 
This is deeply embedded primal jealousy originally associated with the fear of losing mother. I've noticed this pattern operating strongly in people who have squares to Leo from either Taurus or Scorpio. In fact, I think the whole generation with Pluto in Leo, the sign of specialness, is trying to work through some of these issues. But it is ultimately a universal human dilemma. One part of us which is more mature and which is governed by the self-reflective and more recently evolved cerebral cortex area of the brain can reason that, my lover's individuation demands that he or she has other needs and interests besides me which fulfill them. Very well, this is undoubtedly true. However, the more primitive parts of our brain and the frightened infant in us are meanwhile plunged into a state of terror at such a prospect. Audience, I think that we have to learn to become our own mothers and fathers and stop projecting those things onto other people. Howard, yes, I would agree, although this is not always so easy because of these, older parts, of our brain. But much in the same way as Jean Houston worked with Meredith, if we find our own inner mother and learn to nurture and look after ourselves, then we take the burden off someone else to have to do it for us. We take the onus off someone else to make up for what we were deprived of as children. Now, a few more things about the oral stage. It's during this phase of life that we start to develop teeth. With the advent of teeth, a crisis occurs. When the teeth come in there is the natural urge to want to bite. So we are happily feeding at the breast, let's say, and then we have this urge to bite. We bite, mother is startled and taken aback, and the breast is quickly withdrawn. Should weaning come at the stage you are developing teeth, this gives rise to an association that being aggressive biting, in this case means losing love. We are left with a deeply ingrained belief that if we are assertive or aggressive we risk losing love, wholeness, and a sense of unity with life and mother. In one sense, growing teeth is analogous to developing autonomy and individuality. Time is marching on and we are beginning to further differentiate ourselves from a Euroboric wholeness with the mother. Before growing teeth, we have to swallow everything whole, now we have the ability to chew things over, breaking things down into component parts and making whatever we take in more digestible. Bear in mind that the advent of teeth and starting to bite, which is an aggressive act means we are becoming more of a separate individual. It's comparable to a shift from the twelfth house to a sixth house kind of experience, or a shift from the moon and Neptune to the sun, Mars and Mercury you see what is happening, other archetypes besides Neptune prenatal phase and the moon oral phase are beginning to be activated and take precedence. The anal phase. The next phase is the anal phase. The zone of the body associated with this phase is the sphincter and the concern is our ability to control the sphincter muscles. This phase occurs roughly between the ages of two and four, and some writers have labeled it, the terrible twos. Whereas in the oral phase we formed opinions about what the world is going to be like for us based on how we experienced mother and the early environment, in the anal phase we are forming opinions about what sort of person we are, about our power, worth, and general capabilities. The issue is no longer trust versus mistrust, but autonomy versus shame and doubt. The main question is no longer, what kind of place is this world? But rather, how do I feel about myself? Or, what kind of person am I? Or, am I powerful and effective or dirty, nasty, bad and impotent? The archetypes which are clearly brought to focus during this stage are those of the Sun and Mars. Our own inborn expectations and archetypal patterns, as shown by the Sun and Mars, are brought out and embellished. I have also noted that oppositions between Taurus Scorpio, Cancer Capricorn, and Virgo Pisces may show problems or difficulties with this stage. In other words, keep an eye on the earth-water polarity. I'll explain more about this later. Another major question that arises during this phase is the one of who decides. Who decides, you or me? Mother or child? During the anal phase we are establishing greater separateness, individuality, and autonomy. This is directly related to certain physiological changes. We are becoming better coordinated and our range of influence is extending. We learn to walk and we begin to talk, we can explore more. More of the world begins to open up to us. Previously we were mostly in a receptive position, taking things in or gripping onto things. Now we are able to assert ourselves more directly onto the environment. 
Given that we feel reasonably secure and providing that the environment is not overly repressive, we naturally enjoy our increasing autonomy and independence. Ironically, however, our increasing ability to move about and operate in the world confronts us with a frustrating sense of our own smallness and inadequacy. There are things out there which are much bigger than us, which scare and threaten us. There are limits to what we are allowed to do or say. Mother gets angry and foul with us if we want to extend our autonomy out onto a busy road or if we say certain things she doesn't like. We are made to feel shameful and nasty because of some of the things we take pleasure in doing and trying. This is why Erickson highlighted the dilemma of autonomy versus shame and doubt for this stage point 18. Mother takes on the role of the great, no sayer, inhibiting us and curtailing certain forms of expression. If, when you express your autonomy and individuality at this stage, you are for some reason chastised or slapped down, then you develop a sense of being bad and impotent against life. Later on, whenever you want to express your will or your independence, it may be accompanied by feelings of insecurity and anxiety. If you are brought up in too repressive or judgmental an environment, then you may grow up thinking that you dare not be yourself or that you need others to tell you what to do. You feel guilty to transgress authority or stand up for your own rights. You are left with a feeling that life is more powerful than you. We'll look at astrological correlates to these kinds of experiences in a minute. There is no doubt that children are difficult at this stage, but it would help if the parents appreciated the positive implications of the development of the will for a child's growth. Sometimes I watch the way a mother puts down a child and it really hurts me. I see it on the street or in a restaurant and sometimes I feel like reaching for my diary and booking an appointment for the child for the year 2003 when he grows up into an adult with serious personality problems. I saw something like this at the supermarket the other day. A child about four or so was helping his mother push the supermarket trolley. His mother went off to pick up some other things from a different shelf and told him to stand just where he was with the trolley and not to move. So, the mother went further down the aisle and the little boy stood there fixed to the spot with the trolley obeying his mother's instructions perfectly. But the problem was that the child was blocking everybody's way. A few people asked him to move over with the trolley. He was really in the way and finally he did it, he started to walk further down the aisle with the cart and the people passed by. Just at that point, the mother came back and saw him moving the cart. She started screaming at him and slapped him. I told you not to move that trolley. I watched this poor kid in this predicament. I must admit, I couldn't keep my mouth shut and I had to intervene. Right over the tinned peaches counter I started to tell the mother just what had happened and giving her a little lecture on the development of the will and autonomy versus shame and doubt. She looked back at me with a mixture of horror and blankness. But really, what an experience for the poor boy. I wonder what statement about life and the use of his will he was forming. He was certainly in a double bind, either way he couldn't win. The Battle of the Chamber Pot It's almost a cliché to talk about how toilet training affects our development, but this is a major concern of the anal stage. The Battle of the Chamber Pot, as it is sometimes called, is actually symbolic of many other conflicts we go through in the struggle to become socialized. In most cases, the mother is the prime socializing influence on you and your first big act of socialization is sphincter control. Now, what happens here? Issues around authority figures, self-assertion, self-control and power are brought to the fore. Who is going to win? If mother insists, you go when I say go, or, you go only when I tell you to go, then later in life there is an expectation that authority figures will be cruel, harsh and inconsiderate. If mother's will is overimposed on your will in this respect, then you may not believe in your own authority, in your own ability to operate as a separate individual. Then there is the reverse situation. If mother is too easy and she allows you to go whenever you want, then you form the belief that only your will matters, only what you want counts, and you haven't learned to compromise. Then there is the case of mother being inconsistent. Sometimes she forces toilet training on you and sometimes she lets you do what you want. In this case you may grow up never knowing whether your will is right or not. When to assert and when not to assert, when to take control and when not to take control, become very confusing later on in life.
In a curious way, toilet training resonates with issues around being creative. As children we take a certain pride in producing our feces. It is one of the first things our bodies produce. We feel that feces is something we are creating. Inherently, we don't feel shameful about it, but eventually we learn that it is bad and nasty. One of the patterns brought out during the anal phase is whether we feel what we create is good or bad. This is related to issues later in life around how the world will receive our creations. Now, if you are made to feel that what you are creating is dirty and shameful, then you are left with a feeling that what you assert or give out is unserable. In the anal phase, you discover that there are bits of you that mother doesn't love. This is scary because you still need her love to survive. Creating something she doesn't like makes you feel ashamed and frightened. It's a bit like the feeling you may experience in a classroom when you ask a question or make a comment which just doesn't fit in, or which nobody picks up on, we say, you dropped a clanger. After dropping a clanger, you are left with a sense of shame and you just want to disappear and hide away. These kinds of feelings stem from the anal phase. Another issue activated during the anal stage is when to hold on and when to let go. This applies not only to feces but also to whether we hold on to and suppress feelings or whether we freely express them. Some people are anal expulsive. Whatever is inside them explodes all over the place, sometimes leaving a mess wherever they go. Others are anal retentive. Everything is tight and held in. You don't know what is lurking in there, but something smells. Astrological Correlations as I said earlier, the sign placement and aspects of the Sun and Mars in particular are brought out and given flesh during the anal stage. The Sun gives us our sense of being a separate individual and Mars is related to how we assert our will. Right from birth, even before Mother sits you down on the potty and says, Go, you have an inborn predisposition to expect certain things to happen when you assert your individuality, or when you are being creative and expressive, or when you are coming up against the world or another person's will. Let's play around with this for a while. What might you feel if you have the Sun or Mars trine Jupiter? What are you going to feel about what you have to assert, or who you are? Audience, pretty good. Howard, yes, you are already born thinking, what I have to give out is expansive and wonderful. What if you have Sun square Neptune or Mars square Neptune? How do you feel about what you have to assert, give out or create? Audience, diffident and unsure. Howard, yes, and you may feel guilty about asserting your will as well. I did a chart for a man with an exact Mars square Neptune. When he was quite small, he walked into his grandmother's room and found her dead. For the next 25 or 30 years he walked around believing that something he had done had caused her to die. He mistakenly equated the action of entering her room with causing her death. Neptune obscures whatever it touches, and in the case of Mars it can obscure the true significance of an action. He built up this fantasy that he had made a very bad thing happen, he didn't tell anyone about it and carried his secrets in inside himself. Later in life, he was terrified of asserting himself. He became a civil servant and did his job perfectly. But he kept being rejected for advancement in the service, they told him he wasn't assertive enough or that he didn't have the right kind of drive. I've seen a similar issue with Mars square Pluto. I did a reading for a woman with the Sun, Mercury, and Mars conjunct in Scorpio, all applying to a square with Pluto in Leo. When her progressed Sun reached the Mercury-Mars conjunction and approached the exact square to Pluto, her younger brother had a serious accident while she was meant to be looking after him. It is not unlikely that at some earlier time she would have had some negative feelings towards him, because he had intruded into her special place as the first child. She might have wished him out of the way entirely. When the accident happened, she might have thought that her negative feelings towards him made the mishap occur. In the reading, it came out that she had great difficulty achieving what she wanted for herself. She was a great boon to all her friends and exceptionally good helping them with their lives and careers, but not so successful in fulfilling her own personal aims and goals. It is as if she is afraid to realize her own desires because in the past when a personal wish was fulfilled the negative wish towards her younger brother the consequences were disastrous. Audience, the Sun or Mars in difficult aspect to Saturn could also bring out a feeling of being blocked in one's assertion. Howard Yes, indeed. 
In my lecture on, Victims and Saviors, I talked about this. Remember the study done by the psychologist Martin Seligman, 19. He was looking into what kinds of people get depressed and what makes them that way. His theory is called, the learned helplessness model of depression. He found that depression was related to the experience of learning early in life that outcomes were out of your control. He measured something called the, locus of control. If you feel that you have the ability to create your own life, that you have a certain influence or power over what happens to you, then you have an internal locus of control. However, if you feel that what happens to you is beyond your control then you have an external locus of control. Seligman found that depressed patients tended to be people who have an external locus of control, they have lost the belief that they have the power to act on their own behalf, or to influence their own experiential world. They develop a sense of helplessness and hopelessness. I've noticed an astrological correlation to his theories. Those with Sun and Mars in difficult aspect to Neptune often tend to develop an external locus of control, they feel their own power is somewhat impotent, diffused, or ineffective. They may fantasize about having great power and influence, but underneath is a sense of impotency. Those with the Sun or Mars square or in hard aspect to Saturn also have a feeling that their personal will or expression is restricted or limited or that they will endlessly burn pee up against brick walls. Both types may try to compensate for such aspects by attempting to be extra tough, hard, or assertive, almost caricaturing the image of a macho man. Or they continually have to test their will and prove their worth over and over again to allay an underlying insecurity about their ineffectiveness. The anger and frustration at those who appear to be blocking them may erupt into violence from time to time. Or the frustrated will to power may turn inward and give rise to various forms of self-destructive behavior. Or they may look mild and compliant, but underneath they are angry and dangerously explosive. Audience, what would you correlate with an internal locus of control? Howard, can you answer that? Audience, Maybe something like Mars trine Jupiter, or the Sun or Mars in good aspect to Uranus. That would give the power to direct one's own life. Howard, more likely than not. Audience, what if you have some aspects which block the Sun and Mars but also other aspects which suggest you can direct your life and freely express yourself? Howard, then in some situations you feel mighty, or in control, or the one who calls the punches, while in other situations you quake in your boots. Check out the houses involved to see in which area of life the one or the other situation is met. Audience, don't you think that in our culture this is partly gender related? I find that a lot of women clients are most afraid of expressing their power. Howard, cultural conditioning must be taken into consideration. As children, women do receive more messages about not expressing their anger or assertiveness. You know, things like, you're not a pretty sight when you get angry. Or, no man will want you if you are too demanding. So what happens to a woman who has a strong Mars or powerful Sun? Let's say a woman is born with Mars, Jupiter, and Uranus conjunct in Aries on the Ascendant trine her Sun in Leo. If we understand the chart to be a set of celestial instructions about how she can best unfold who she is, then she had better develop some of that stuff on the Ascendant. I believe that more likely than not she will, one way or another, she will interpret the environment as conducive to her being assertive. But let's say she has the moon in Cancer and her mother told her to be demure and sweet all the time. Then what's going to happen? There are various possibilities. She listens to her mother and denies her Mars-Jupiter-Uranus conjunction in Aries on the Ascendant, and is miserably unhappy because we are unhappy if we are not true to ourselves. Or, she finds ways of looking sweet and demure on the outside and subtly she is manipulating everyone around her to get precisely what she wants. Or, she marries a man who lives out her unexpressed power need, what some call the Hollywood wife syndrome. Hopefully, though, she decides not just to live from her moon, she takes steps to develop her own will and authority but finds ways to do this which are tactful and sensitive. In this way she is both the sensitive moon and the more self-sufficient Aries conjunction. It will take practice to learn how to be more assertive and yet not overly aggressive. Earth-Water Polarities Before the break, I want to say a few more things about the anal phase and looking at it astrologically. 
Earlier I mentioned that you should consider the earth-water polarities in this respect. Let me explain how this fits. Take Cancer opposite Capricorn. If you see this opposition brought out in the chart, then anal issues could be highlighted. Cancer is instinctive, primitive, and chaotic, whereas Capricorn adjusts to society and accepts boundaries, rules and limits. This opposition highlights the dilemma between being instinctive and being civilized. You may favor one side of the opposition and see the other part as the enemy or as being forced on you. So you want to be free-flowing and natural cancer, but you see the world stopping you Capricorn and telling you to act more respectably. Or, you are exceptionally orderly, tidy, and respectful of etiquette Capricorn, and you experience people who are too emotional or instinctive cancer as threatening or disgusting. The opposition is within you, the battle is between two different ways of being which are inside you. Or take a Virgo and Pisces opposition. Pisces doesn't want to have to control itself too much, it is a loose sign. Virgo, however, wants life to run to a routine. Taurus and Scorpio also bring up issues of appetite indulgence versus appetite mastery, or holding on to things versus letting them go. Zonal confusion. Another thing you should be aware of about the anal phase is that power issues can become mixed up with feeding issues. If you are determined to assert your will over the mother, then you might also refuse to eat as a way of exercising autonomy. Some research into anorexia has suggested that the anorexic deems it more important to have power and control over her own body than to survive and eat on demand. Also, be aware that power issues can easily become mixed up with sexuality issues. There could be a connection between sexual dysfunctions like retarded ejaculation or premature ejaculation and the whole conflict of holding on or letting go. For instance, if your mother really wanted you to go to the toilet on demand and you are angry at her for it, your way of getting back is to say no and hold on. This can be displaced from the anal zone to the phallic zone, what is sometimes called, zonal confusion. So, a man who, as a boy, was very angry with his mother because she was so demanding could revenge himself against women later in life. With premature ejaculation, he lets go too soon. In some cases of retarded ejaculation, he is depriving or holding back. Aspects to Mars may shed light on some of these situations. The Third House The Third House has some relation to the anal phase because of its association with movement and mobility during the anal phase we gain sufficient physiological coordination to move around the environment more easily. Signs and planets in the third reveal our predisposition to selectively perceive certain aspects of the immediate environment and neglect or overlook others. For instance, those with Venus in the third would pick up on the more pleasing and welcoming aspects of the environment. Correspondingly, they will feel congenial and hospitable with what is around them. But those with Saturn in the third of may perceive the more sinister, restrictive or colder features of the environment. Therefore, in their eyes, it is not a safe place in which to freely move about. How we feel about siblings and our interaction with them will also be shown by the third as well. For a child, the ability to move about in the environment is very important because movement is experience. Both movement and experience stimulate the brain and stimulate thinking. Hence, we associate the third house not only with the immediate environment but also with the mind, with how we think. You notice that when I lecture, I move around a great deal. I find that moving around activates my thinking and helps me make connections. You could say that movement actually helps the brain to develop. Mercury is the natural ruler of the third which rules short journeys as well as thinking. Some researchers experimented with monkeys along these lines. There were two groups, some were reared in a cage with a moving pendulum and another group were brought up in a cage with a stationary pendulum. The little monkeys reared with the stationary pendulum grew up more terrified of humans, less exploratory and generally maladaptive compared to the others. Perhaps we can deduce that if during the anal phase children are kept under too tight a rein, they are not only limited in movement and experience, but their brains may not develop as well compared to children who are allowed more freedom. Restriction of movement and experience doesn't just mean being kept in a playpen too long. Parents can put their children into mental straight jackets. Some children are only allowed to think or say certain thoughts which are in line with what the parents approve. 
In this way, the children are conditioned into having to be very careful about what they do, say, or think, and, therefore, they lose the ability to be spontaneous and immediate. If they hate a teacher at school, they can't come home and talk about it. They have to suppress the thoughts and figure out what is acceptable to say. Consequently, certain feelings never get fully dealt with and the whole psyche becomes congested. Examine your third house for issues relating to this, spontaneity versus inhibition of thought, movement, and experience. If you studied biology at school you probably heard the phrase, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. In the womb we evolve from being a fish to being a human. Similarly, in the first 36 months of life we recapitulate that evolutionary development again. Jean Houston has a chapter in The Possible Human called, Awakening Your Evolutionary History. 20. She worked with Moshe Feldenkrais on these ideas, he was the founder of a technique which helps develop greater awareness through movement. Houston's idea is that if we fail in the first 36 months of life to have a smooth transition from being a fish to being an amphibian to being a reptile to being a monkey until we stand erect as a human, then damage is done to the overall psychology. When we are born we have a fish brain, we move around like a fish, and there is a part of us which needs to be able to function like a fish. In turn, these movements activate growth of that part of the brain which deals with amphibian and reptilian development. At this stage the infant begins to crawl on his belly and to coordinate movement of the arms and legs. We should really all get on the floor and try these phases. This movement in turn activates the early mammalian parts of the brain and we begin to crawl on all fours. The crawling movement activates the neo-mammalian parts of the brain and we start to make movements similar to those of a monkey, swinging from side to side. I'll demonstrate it for you, like this and so on until the more human parts of the brain are developed. Houston argues that to be physiologically and psychologically healthy we need to fully experience each of these developmental stages. If the child is prevented from fully experiencing the reptilian phase, for instance when he or she begins to crawl on the belly and coordinate movement of the arms and legs as well as learning to coordinate the upper and lower axes of the body then there is a danger of trouble with sexual development. If the child is severely restricted or harnessed during the monkey phase one showed you, then there is a decrease of curiosity and a lessened ability to learn skills and imitate. So movement and some degree of free expression in the early years of life are important if we are to grow into adults who can use more of our full potential. Now, I'd like to move on to the Oedipal phase. The Oedipal stage. Traditionally, the Oedipal stage was thought to have occurred between the ages of four and six, but studies are now putting it earlier, anywhere from age two and a half. Erickson writes that the main issue is that of, initiative versus guilt. 21. The Oedipal phase is known as a three-person area. Previously, in the oral and anal phases there were primarily two people involved, the child and the mother caretaker. However, during the Oedipal phase the child becomes much more aware of the father and the parental relationship in general. The archetype which is constellated at this time is that of union. In the oral phase, love was important, in the anal phase the will is developed, but in the Oedipal phase love and will are seen to be operating together. The main planet which is activated during this phase is Venus, although this stage of life will constellate certain other parts of the chart which I'll discuss more fully shortly. Let's say something first about the role of the father. In the very early years of life, the mother is usually much more obvious to the child than the father. As you grow older, you become increasingly aware of, the otherness, of the father. In the beginning you are at one with your mother, that Euroboric wholeness we mentioned earlier. Father can be experienced as an intrusion or disruption into the Euroboric mother-child cocoon. In normal circumstances, you are with the mother all day and you establish a close bond with her. Then father arrives home from work and he brings something wholly different into the home, he brings the smell of the outside world home with him. Liz once pointed out that someone with Sun Square Pluto could experience the father's arrival as a kind of rape or intrusion into the intactness with the mother. Sun in difficult aspect to Mars or Uranus might also give this experience, or an image of the father as violent and unpredictable. Later in life, women with these kinds of aspects may carry an image of the man as a rapist, etc. 
More positively, the father provides the needed energy of the masculine principle which helps you separate from the mother. With pretty good aspects to the son, the father is often seen as someone who can prepare and advise you about how to go out and do battle with the world outside the home and break away from the protective embrace of the mother. He tells you stories about his adventures as a lad, how he had this or that experience. In this way, you are inspired to go out there and face the world yourself. He equips you to be a hero or heroine. If the father hasn't done too well with the world himself, then he is not a very good role model for this. The girl child with a disappointing father may grow up expecting all men to be like that, or else will be looking for the ideal father she didn't have. On the other hand, if the father appears all too wonderful and never shows any of his faults or weaknesses, then the boy child might worry about ever being as good as his father. The girl child in this case might spend the rest of her life comparing the men she meets to this idealized image she had as a little girl about her father. I can't go into all the astrological correlations with these kinds of experiences, they are too complex and too varied to do now. But bear these typical patterns in mind when you are looking at a chart and see if any of them fit with aspects to the sun and placements in the fourth if you take the fourth to mean the father. For instance, if you are looking at a woman's chart and you see that she has Sun conjunct Jupiter, it is worth exploring if the father was tied up with the Jupiter projection. I've heard many women with this aspect talk about how divine and wonderful the father was or is. It reminds me of Fallon in the soap opera Dynasty, who only sees positive things in Blake Carrington. It will be difficult for other men to live up to the little girl's image of a Jupiterian father. Or, with Sun in aspect to Neptune, a girl child may idealize her father and then as she grows older she sees him in a different light and is disappointed or let down. This, too, can become a pattern for her with men later on. As you move from the oral phase to the anal phase to the Oedipal stage, the urge to express and assert yourself becomes stronger. Sexuality emerges more clearly. As the sex drive increases, it is usually lived out in a fantasy with the parent of the opposite sex. On a deeper, more symbolic level, what is happening is that the contrasexual element of your nature is being activated. Oedipal desires give you the first real introduction to the sex that you are not. The boy child who has previously separated from the mother during the anal phase is now consciously seeing her as different from himself and making contact with his own, inner femaleness, through desiring her. The girl is making contact with her own, inner maleness, through desiring the father. You project your image of the masculine or feminine onto father or mother and you attempt to complete yourself by reuniting with that image. Symbolically, the incest wish can be understood as an attempt to unite the male and female principle in yourself. It is at this stage that the boy projects the moon and Venus onto his mother, and the girl projects her son and Mars onto her father. When the boy desires his mother, in a sense, he is desiring his moon and Venus back. When the girl desires the father, she is attempting to reunite with her own son and Mars. In the early years, you experience much of your chart as external to yourself, as being out there. Individuation involves taking back into the self what you have previously attributed to others in this way. The Oedipal complex or the Electra complex as it is called for women is actually an attack on the parental relationship. I don't believe that the child literally wants the parent sexually, Rather the child wants to be the most special person to the opposite sex parent and resents the same sex parent obstructing this. As the boy child becomes more aware of the father, he also becomes aware that the father is a rival for the mother's attention. The boy sees her paying attention to the father and he feels jealous because he wants her all to himself. The girl child is seeking to unite with the father and sees the mother as the rival. Traditionally, at least, this is how it is. I've noticed that people with strong placements in Leo often have great difficulty with the Oedipal phase, Leo is so concerned with being special and the center of attention. Aries is another sign that may carry issues related to Oedipal rivalry, it likes to beat others and loathes being rejected. Libra is another sign which is acutely aware of what is happening in relationship, so it is sensitive to Oedipal issues. And I wouldn't put it past Gemini to entangle itself in various triangles. Scorpio likes to undermine the one who has the most power and influence. We are gradually covering all the signs now, 
The Oedipal dilemma is fairly universal for one reason or another. Erickson wrote that this phase highlighted the issue of initiative versus guilt. Let's consider this from the point of view of the boy-child first. The initiative is expressed in the desire to win the mother and conquer the father. The sense is, I want to get rid of daddy and take over his role with mummy. Thus, we have a triangle forming. Obviously, on some level the boy will be feeling guilty about his desires. The boy fears his father might find out what he is thinking and then punish him. The situation is similar for the girl child. She fears her mother will find out that she wants daddy to herself and then she will be punished. All of us experience a common regression back to the Oedipal phase when we have the feeling that if people really knew what we were thinking or wanting, we would be disliked or punished. Now, in terms of the boy child, he is competing with the father, I'm a big boy now and I'd like to have mummy to myself and get rid of daddy. But then the boy starts to compare himself to his father and usually he doesn't fare too well by comparison. Daddy is bigger, daddy is better equipped to take care of mummy's needs, daddy works and earns money so he can look after her better, and what's more, daddy already has her. Similarly, the little girl starts comparing herself to mother, well, mother can cook and run the house better than me, she is so much better skilled at keeping daddy, etc. Both the little boy and girl must face the fact that they are small and inadequate compared to their respective rivals. Another common regression back to the Oedipal stage is the feeling which many of us have of being afraid that other people will find out that we are not as good and able as they think we are. A fear may linger from this phase that other people will discover that underneath it all we are inadequate and inept. 99 people can applaud you and say you are wonderful, and then one person says you are not really that great and you say, aha, now I have been found out. If you are truly stuck in the Oedipal stage, you will remain feeling inadequate and inferior to other people your whole life. The little boy or little girl in you is still comparing yourselves to big people. We have worked ourselves into a tight corner. How do we resolve this dilemma? The resolution of the Oedipal complex comes when the boy child stops trying to compete with daddy and decides to emulate or imitate him. There is no use competing with daddy, he is obviously way ahead of me, so why don't I try to be like him and then when I grow up I can get a mummy for myself. And the girl child decides to be like her mother so she can get a daddy for herself one day. Rather than competing with and trying to depose the parent of the same sex, we choose to identify with them and model ourselves on being like them. However, there can be complications in this stage. What if the mother actually finds the little boy more desirable and attractive than the father? If the father is hopeless at providing, lousy in bed, a drunken bastard and the parental relationship unfulfilling, then the mother may actually turn to the little boy for the kind of emotional satisfaction she should be deriving from the father and the marriage. A kind of erotic quality, not necessarily explicitly sexual, begins to creep into her maternal relationship with her son. At first, this may seem wonderful to the boy, gee, I won, but underneath there is the feeling he has destroyed the father and that sooner or later he will be punished for this. It also means that the boy's libidinal energy remains so tied up with the mother that it isn't free to flow in other directions or into other relationships. He stays, mummy's big boy, and the father is shut out. A proper relationship is not formed with the same sex parent. A similar situation can occur for the little girl if her father turns to her for the kind of emotional appreciation and love which he is not getting from the mother. She feels she has won the competition with the mother, fears the mother's reprisal and risks perennially remaining, daddy's little girl. A similar difficulty could arise if the opposite sex parent dies or leaves home during the Oedipal years. The father might go off to war or the parents might get divorced. Again, the little boy thinks he has won the mother from the father, but also harbors the fear that he will be punished for having destroyed the father. The same thing would happen to the little girl if her mother leaves or dies during this period. To make it even more complicated, there is also something known as the reverse Oedipal complex, or the homosexual Oedipal dilemma. Normally the child desires the parent of the opposite sex. But what if the opposite sex parent is so unsirable that there is no way that the child would crave that parent? If mother is so ghastly for whatever reason, it might be that the boy will want to win the father and get rid of mother, 
Or if the father is so awful, the little girl may want to marry mother and do away with the father. In these cases, the boy may want to provide for the father what the mother should be providing, and the little girl may want to provide for the mother what the father should be giving. This is the reverse our homosexual Oedipal complex. And, of course, there are further complications to this stage if we consider the growing number of single-parent families. In these cases, the parents' lovers may be drawn into the scenario. Audience, what kind of aspects would you put with the reverse Oedipal complex? Howard, I can't give you any hard and fast rules here, but there are a few things I've noticed. Consider the case of the boy child finding the mother so difficult or unappealing that he wants to win father rather than her. I've seen this situation in the charts of men where the moon has very difficult aspects, but the sun is well aspected. If the moon is in a mess, then the boy may have a lot of problems relating to the mother or he may find her intolerable, therefore the father, as shown by the favorable sun aspects, is more desirable and attractive. The converse situation could exist for women, when the sun is weak or difficultly aspected, but the moon is pretty clear. In this case, the little girl could find the father unattractive or he even might be virtually non-existent physically, emotionally or mentally, what's called, an absent father. In these cases, the little girl's libidinal drive could stay linked with the mother and doesn't switch over to father. In general, however, the Oedipal complex is resolved when the urge to emulate and identify with the same-sex parent becomes stronger than the urge to compete. It is very important how lovingly the opposite-sex parent rejects the child's advances to marry them. The father has to appreciate the daughter's grace and beauty and yet not let her think that she can have him all to herself. The father needs to reject her lovingly. The mother has to make the son feel she is not rejecting him because he is too weedy and insufficient. The Oedipal dilemma resurfaces in adolescence with the rivalry of the boys in the class for the best girls and vice versa. Throughout life you can still see vestiges of this complex with women or men who always seem to fall in love with people who are already married or who are unobtainable for some reason. I am thinking of two clear cases right now. One is a man with moon conjunct Pluto in Leo in the seventh, he has a history of breaking up other people's marriages. In some way he proves his worth and adequacy via competition with another man for that man's wife. The moon in the house of relationship immediately equates the area of partnership with mother issues, and Pluto in Leo brings in the idea of rivalry, intrigue, and unconscious complexes. Some women with sun in aspect to Neptune seem to fall in love with men who are already married or hard to get, and there could be unresolved Oedipal influences creeping in here. A similar situation arises quite often with Venus in aspect to Neptune, wanting that which is elusive or difficult to have, and then the need to sacrifice the relationship in one form or another. Audience, what about Venus in aspect to Uranus? Howard, I don't think that necessarily suggests Oedipal issues. In my experience, this is more frequently what is known as a freedom closeness dilemma. One part of the person wants union, Venus, but another part craves independence and freedom, Uranus, so the person sometimes chooses a lover with whom it is difficult to make a lasting bind, and in that way the Venus-Uranus person stays loose. Another later manifestation of leftover Oedipal feelings is the desire to be noticed for how wonderful you are without necessarily doing anything to earn that recognition. It's the difference between demanding attention rather than gaining attention. Earlier, I associated the Oedipal complex with the Leo side of our natures and the desire to be appreciated in this way is very leonine. I know people with strong Leo placements who have a burning desire to be applauded for their abilities and yet they are afraid to seriously develop their talents in case they fail. They think that other people should see how special and wonderful they are before they have proven it. This is similar to feelings in the Oedipal child who wants to be seen as good as mummy or daddy, as good as an adult, before they have actually arrived there. Sometimes exhibitionism is a hangover from the Oedipal phase. Leos are generally known for this, but I believe it is a Sagittarian trait as well. The Oedipal dilemma has a fire and air feeling about it. Fire wants to stand out and be special, while air is learning to adapt itself to being part of a larger system. 
Leo wants to be special and unique and the most central, but Aquarius sees itself functioning as part of a system, and asks that power be distributed equally among the components. Aspects to Venus will be constellated during the Oedipal phase. We have already talked about how Venus in aspect to Saturn expects pain and restriction in relationship. Those who have Pluto in aspect to Venus might have a very difficult Oedipal phase because the archetype of union is in aspect to the planet of destructive and secretive energy, which is what is entailed in the Oedipal phase anyway. Audience, what about Venus in aspect to the Moon? Howard this aspect could easily denote Oedipal problems, especially in a man's chart. The image of the moon mother becomes entangled with Venus, the image of the beloved and union. There is a mix-up of the maternal moon and the erotic Venus. The feminine principle has many different facets. One is the mother who feeds you and looks after you and the other is the lover or mistress who tantalizes, flirts, stimulates and seduces. The boy with moon in aspect to Venus has trouble separating these. Often there is a collusion here. The mother is feeding the child and experiencing something erotic and sensual through it at the same time, the child also gets an erotic stimulation from being fed. If the mother is not fulfilling her sexual and emotional needs through her husband, she may pour all of herself into the relationship with the child. Feelings and sensations of a sensual nature well up as she is performing the mothering role. So these kinds of loving innuendos pass between the mother and child. Such a situation might keep the boy hooked in the Oedipal phase longer, or there is no room in his life for other kinds of relationships with women because he is so involved with the mother. Some men with moon and Venus in hard aspect have difficulty in marriage later in life. If a man sees his wife too much as a mother, moon he may lose his sexual feelings for her Venus because it is such a societal taboo to have sex with the mother. Audience does Venus square Saturn mean that the child felt rejected by the parent he or she wanted to unite with? Howard. Yes, possibly. The little girl with Venus in difficult aspect to Saturn may be left with the feeling that she lacks something which would make her attractive to the father. Later in life she may unconsciously equate a man she is after with the father she didn't win. Succeeding in attracting the present man's love is tied up with the little girl in her still trying to get daddy. Instead of falling for people who also fall in love with her, she is attracted to those who are more of a challenge, if I could only win this person's love, then I've proven I'm not so bad. Or, she tries to avoid the whole conflict altogether and goes for men who feel safe and who don't trigger her insecurity. Some women with Venus in hard aspect to Saturn may look rather self-sufficient and independent, but underneath they are often highly sensitive and vulnerable to rejection. We often try to mask where Saturn is. The school age. This next phase is called, the school age, or sometimes, the play age, and is normally linked to ages 6 through 10. It is the equivalent to Freud's, latency period, the quiet before the storm of puberty. Erickson writes that the issue is, industry versus inferiority. 22. We are coming through the Oedipal dilemma and beginning to think, okay, I'm not an adult yet, but I can start working toward being grown up and start learning how to be a good mummy or daddy of the future. This is the time for seriously developing those skills which will enable you to function more independently in the world. We go to school and begin to relate more regularly with other people besides our parents. We begin to get a sense of who we are in relationship to others than just our family. We broaden our awareness of life in general. We are beginning to explore ourselves as potential adults. The archetypes which come into play during this phase are ones which have to do with productivity and competence. If we do well at this stage it helps us to grow up thinking we are capable and effective people. If this phase is difficult, we feel inadequate and inferior to others. It's obvious that how we fare in this period has much to do with how things went during the earlier anal and oral phases, when we developed an even more basic sense of our worth or goodness. In the Oedipal stage we measured ourselves against adults and didn't have much of a chance. In the school age we measure ourselves against our peers. We crave recognition for producing things. We need a certain feeling of pleasure in being productive. Astrologically, Mercury, Jupiter, and Saturn all relate to issues of this stage. Placements involving these planets will be brought to the fore during this period. Mercury shows the kind of mind we have 
how we learn and whether we feel confident or insecure about our mental ability. Mercury also has something to do with how we use our hands and how adept we are with tools. Mercury square Saturn may be a mind that works more slowly than others, and, therefore, those with this placement may feel insecure about their mental capability. Sometimes, they feel they have to work extra hard to prove themselves. Mercury in difficult aspect to Uranus may reason and think in a markedly different way from other children. Those with this placement might feel alienated and uncertain of where they fit in. Mercury in aspect to Neptune could be a spatial, right brain type mind, and may not be very much at home with traditional education which stresses a more rational, linear, left brain approach. The third house will also give a sense of how a person experiences school. More often than not, Jupiter in this house has a good time of it and feels alright about the self in this sphere. Saturn in the third brings out feelings of uncertainty or inadequacy and worries about fitting in. For those with Pluto in the third, doing well at school and being considered intelligent may become almost a life-death issue. If I do well and prove how bright I am, then I will live, if not, I might be destroyed. Naturally, a person with this placement won't feel too comfortable at school for these reasons. How can he or she ever relax if life and death issues are at stake? The sixth house also relates to skill development, and placements there are likely to be brought to the fore during the school age. Also, the sixth house carries the issue of what it is like to work alongside other people, which is something else we learn more about during this phase. You may wonder why I associate Jupiter and Saturn with this age. Jupiter applies because it is a time during which we are growing and expanding our possibilities. We aspire to be like certain heroes or heroines we admire. Jupiter is the dangling carrot which pulls us forward, the urge to be something bigger and better. Saturn is around at this stage, however, because we are encouraged to grow only within certain restrictions and limits. Through the educational system, society is trying to form us into good citizens, to direct our aspirations Jupiter into acceptable Saturnian forms. We are encouraged to grow and to expand our creativity and productivity, but it has to be within the confines of what is normal or collectively validated Saturn. Audience, what if somebody has Jupiter in hard aspect to Saturn? Will it make this stage more difficult? Howard. Yes, it could. The child's desire to explore and expand Jupiter may be squeezed by the restraints of Saturn. Or he is so aware of being judged and watched Saturn that he is afraid to be free and expressive in a Jupiterian manner. A similar dilemma could arise with Saturn in difficult aspect to Uranus. Highly individualistic and creative Uranian urges may be quashed by a need to conform to the way something is traditionally meant to be done. Another Jupiter-Saturn type problem is biting off more than you can chew. At this stage, a child is trying to be as good as an adult and may not be respecting the limits of his or her age, experience, and size. This is a form of exaggerated initiative, which can be dangerous because a child is likely to fail at being as good as an adult at that stage. If this occurs, a lingering sense of being a failure can stay with the person for life. Or, the child becomes an adult who keeps making big plans which are unrealistic and almost doomed not to succeed. People with Jupiter or Neptune square Saturn are often painfully aware of the discrepancy between where they actually are and where they would like to be. Adolescence. There is not much time left, but I want to introduce the phase of adolescence which occurs anywhere from ages 10, 11, 12 to 19, 20, or 21. During this phase, you emerge out of the womb of the family into society. It is akin to another birth. Through adolescence, all the earlier stages of growth are recapitulated and brought to the surface again. Unfinished business and unresolved feelings from the oral phase reappear. Is this a safe world for me to survive in? Unresolved feelings and patterns from the anal phase are there in adolescence as well. Am I going to be good enough for the world, will I be potent, effective, good or bad? And Oedipal issues re-emerge with a vengeance. How will I fare in relationships? Will one be popular and attract the people I want to attract? One of the nicer things I've heard said about the difficult period of adolescence is that it affords the opportunity to redeem what has gone wrong in childhood. 
The old issues resurface again, if you didn't feel that your mother was a safe container as a child, when you venture out into the world during adolescence you may feel it is not a safe place. But at least you have the opportunity to more consciously work through these feelings and change some of the earlier patterns. A teacher may provide you with something your mother didn't provide, and therefore mediates some of your negative expectations. A close relationship may heal your Oedipal wounds. Being older, you have had a chance to acquire certain skills and abilities, which means you can handle the world more effectively than when you were screaming away helpless in the crib. The central concern of adolescence is the search for identity. You spend hours in front of the mirror trying to figure out who you are. You experiment playing different roles and being different people. The quest for your sexual identity becomes an urgent, pressing concern. Adolescence can be broadly classified into four main types or categories. Point two, three. First, there are the conventional types. These are the people who generally marry young and don't question the values or ideals of their parents or society. They do similar things the parents did. Usually Saturn or Capricorn is strong in their charts. There is no struggle to find a sense of individuality in one's own right, no adolescent rebellion. Later on in life, often during the midlife crisis when Uranus opposes Uranus, or Saturn opposes Saturn, these people actively rebel against the constrictions and conventions into which they have previously slotted. In other words, their adolescent rebellion catches up with them at midlife. Then there are the idealistic types. They are moody, romantic, and dreamy. Some are highly moralistic and obsessed with perfection. Some are revolutionaries absorbed with progressive movements. Usually they have strong Uranian or Neptunian charts, with a dash of Mars and Jupiter thrown in. They discover transcendental meditation at 18 and are going to change the world through it. They become absorbed into a vision of what life can be like, invariably contrary to how their parents lived. If their parents were the sort who were heavily involved with Whole Food and the Peace Movement, sometimes the idealistic adolescent will swing just the other way. You have to be tough and aggressive to survive in this world, and they become punks or whatever. A third type of adolescent is the hedonist, the beach boy, the surfer, or the dropout. They could drift into drugs, glue sniffing or even casual prostitution. They may have strong Jupiter or Neptune tendencies in the chart, or perhaps a plutonic fascination for what is taboo and decadent. A fourth type of adolescent might be labeled the psychopath. Here you have your neo-Nazis, your National Front youth in England, some skinheads, or the most extreme varieties of Hell's Angels. In any of these four broad categories, the issue is the search for an identity. In terms of astrological correlations to the phase of adolescence, I have noticed that people with difficult placements in the third house often have quite traumatic times during this period of life. Traditionally, the third house is associated with ages 7 to 14, and placements in this house may describe something about one's initiation into young adulthood. I would also scrutinize the fifth house to see how one fares with issues of dating and romance which are so important at this time. The eighth house reveals something about one's attitude toward sexuality. The eleventh house will describe involvements with groups, social circles and friends, which are all important during this phase of life. In assessing the concerns which crop up during adolescence, it is useful to closely examine the significant transits and progressions which took place anywhere from age 10 and 11 to 17 and 18.24. Keep a close eye on Pluto during this period. In itself, Pluto is an archetype closely aligned with adolescence, you die as a child and are reborn a young adult. The myth of Persephone's abduction by the god Pluto can be read as an analogy for what happens during adolescence. In the beginning, Persephone is the little girl, also known as Kor, the maiden. She is playing innocently in the meadow with various virgin goddesses. It's spring and the ground is moist with flowers. She is under the protective embrace of her mother and then Pluto comes along and abducts her, takes her into the underworld, rapes her and marries her. Something like this happens in adolescence, we are jolted out of childhood innocence. It is often through a passionate crush or sexual encounter that deep underground feelings and emotions are brought to the surface. Adolescence is never an easy transition, but if Pluto is involved in an important transit or progression during this time as well, the wrench out of childhood may be associated with even a greater degree of torment and upheaval.
Just to give you an example of what I mean, let's say a woman has the Sun in 1 degree Scorpio and Pluto at 13 degrees Leo. By secondary progression the Sun makes an exact square to Pluto at age 12. Regardless of the progression, this age is Plutonic in any case because of the striking physical changes taking place in the body at the onset of puberty. Now the girl in question also has an important progression involving Pluto at this time. It's like a double hit of Pluto, and the dramatic intensity of the change is enhanced. She is developing her secondary sex characteristics, her breasts are growing and her pubic hair is showing and menstruation might begin. Up to age 10 or 11 she might still be taking baths with her father, but now it all changes. Daddy can't be quite as physical with her as he used to. Now that she is becoming more womanly it feels awkward and uncomfortable for him. She may then equate her emerging sexual desires with this loss of closeness to the father. She may feel that what is happening to her is bad and causes bad things to occur. A feeling remains even later in life which makes her feel uncertain, guilty or uncomfortable with the sexual side of her nature. If a parent should die while the child is entering adolescence, the child may feel thrust too quickly into having to assume an adult role. If the father dies, then the adolescent boy might have to take on some of his father's role in the family. If the mother dies, the adolescent girl will take over her position. If Saturn, Uranus, or Pluto make important transits or show up by progression during the onset of adolescence, the person may experience a sense of being thrust out of childhood too suddenly. There hasn't been the chance to gradually change from being a dependent child into a more responsible young adult, this person may feel the need to go back and relive that transition more gradually or may need the chance to go back and play out some of the unlived childhood or adolescent urges that were missed because he or she was jolted into adult responsibility too soon. Also, if someone never had a happy childhood, there may be a reluctance to let go of that stage and grow into an adult. The person may want to stay a child in order to still have the chance to experience those things he or she has missed. Another transit to keep an eye on is Saturn coming up to oppose natal Saturn, which happens roughly around age 14. The houses and signs involved will reveal a great deal about the kinds of tests and trials that are important at this time. Saturn opposite Saturn suggests that the patterns which have been troublesome in earlier phases of childhood will be met against via the world and society. Audience what about those children born in the 1960s who have the Uranus and Pluto conjunction in Virgo? Howard, you bring up an interesting point, something called generational aspects. There is a whole generation coming of age who were born with Uranus conjunct Pluto in Virgo from late 1962 to 1968 or thereabouts. Historically, this period was a time of acceleration and change. The world was going a bit crazy. America went crazy after President Kennedy was assassinated and then Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy. The children born then emerged into a world where old values and mores were being challenged and overthrown, as described by Uranus conjunct Pluto. It was the swinging 60s complete with sexual freedom and the rebellion against the establishment. The children born then are now coming of age with this conjunction in their charts. Virgo is the sign linked to work and the labor force. In England, these kids are finishing school and having to look for work in a country where there is mass unemployment, where the whole work thing is in upheaval. Because of this situation, new schemes are being worked out for youth employment opportunity, and we have such things as job sharing in the four-day week. One person I heard about was offering to pay someone to give him a job. This is certainly a Uranian reversal of Virgo affairs. While some of the young people with this aspect are being very creative finding work, Others are turning their rage, nihilism, and sense of injustice Uranus conjunct Pluto towards society. There is a compulsion in the punk movement to shock in the way they dress and adorn their bodies, all Virgo issues. With Uranus and Pluto in earthy Virgo, punks are using their bodies to make a statement to society. On another more positive level, you see a growing interest in alternative health, diet and medicine, Virgo is the sign of health. Time marches on. We usually finish at 5.30, so there is just enough time to put a chart on the board and look at it in reference to some of the things we have been talking about today. Anybody care to be exposed? Thank you, this is Mandy's chart.
Let's look at some of the early progressions of the moon and see what these correspond to. Howard, at age 3 months, the progressed moon conjuncts Jupiter so you are not doing so badly. You are picking up Jupiter via the mother and Jupiter is in the 7th house. My sense is that your mother must have been feeling pretty good, and her relationship with your father must seem okay at that time. Mandy, I know a little about this from what my mother has told me. She was married to my father just a year before I was born and having me was helping to solidify the marriage. She felt good about having me, she felt it was the right thing to do. She was relieved to be in a marriage and doing the conventional stuff. Howard, so mother feels good to you then. But at age 6 months the progressed moon squares Pluto and begins to make an inconjunct to Neptune. So something is changing. Jupiter is not foreground anymore and you are picking up Pluto and Neptune through your mother. Do you know what happened when you were 6 months old? Anything which would spell upheaval or change? Mandy, she got pregnant again. My brother is about a year and 3 months younger than me. Howard, so, the progressed moon is hitting Pluto and mother gets pregnant. You are only 6 months, but somehow you are registering her changing. It must have frightened you in some way. Do you think she wanted to be pregnant again so soon? Mandy, I don't think she was happy about being pregnant again. Not long ago she said to me, I don't understand why you feel so unwanted when you were the only one that was really planned. Howard, the moon is squaring Pluto by progression and she is upset at being pregnant again. She is walking around brooding and maybe seething underneath and you feel it. Your early bonding with the mother starts out fine with Jupiter and then runs into difficulty with Pluto. A relationship starts full of hope and promise but then ends up feeling uncomfortable and threatening. Does this ring a bell for you? Mandy, well, actually, it does. When I start a new relationship it usually feels wonderful to open up, but only for a little while. Then I start thinking, wait, something will get you. Howard, Moon conjunct Jupiter square Pluto, the feelings start by being expansive and open, Jupiter, but then the element of fear and danger Pluto creeps in. So we find a pattern or expectation suggested by that placement. This is one worth exploring and working on. We have tracked it back historically with what happened in relation to the mother. You can also reflect on how it has appeared in your life in other relationships. This is what I mean by experiencing and understanding a pattern. After that, you can try to work more creatively with the planetary principles involved. There's not enough time to do that now. Let's look at a few more things in the chart though. The progressed moon is square Pluto and inconjunct Neptune and Saturn from 6 to 10 months after you are born when your mother is dealing with being pregnant again. She doesn't feel so good to you anymore and her own problems may be obscuring her ability to look after you as well. Then around one year your progressed moon sextiles your Mercury. What happens? Any moves? Mercury sometimes indicates a move. Mandy. Yes, we moved when I was one year old. Howard. You see, just watching the early progressed moon can reveal so much. The progressed moon in Taurus sextiles the Mercury in Pisces. The sextile suggests the move was alright. Mandy. My mother hated where I was born. She liked it better where we moved. Howard, the progressed moon moves into Gemini in the 8th house and your brother is born. That's interesting, the moon changes sign and house and you are seeing your mother in a new light. She is more dual, she is not just there for you now, you have to share her with your brother. Mandy, I'm just calculating in my head now. Around age four and a half, we moved from England to Australia, and I think the progressed moon must have been around Uranus in Cancer in my ninth house near that time. Howard, yes, that fits nicely. Let's leave the progressed moon for now. I'm curious about the Mars opposite Saturn and Neptune. Earlier in the day I was talking about this aspect being associated with an external locus of control, with a feeling that life was more powerful than you or you felt a sense of being impotent and ineffective. Mandy, in 1959, when I was six, my mother was pregnant again and gave birth to, a thing. They still have it in a jar in a university. 
She came home from hospital ill and for the next several years was very depressed, she was mourning for the dead baby. It was born on her birthday. Homard, at that time, Saturn had just moved into your third house, the house of brothers and sisters, and you have this death of a sibling and your mother's depression. Mandy, for the next few years I had to look after my younger brother and sister because my mother was so depressed. I think I felt the Mars opposition to Saturn and Neptune in that way. I was put in charge of my brother and sister and I never felt I could do it very well. Howard, yes, transiting Saturn was moving through the third house of siblings at that time, so you meet difficulty there. Also, your natal Saturn rules Capricorn on the cusp of your third so there is another connection between Saturn and your siblings. Your sense of power and capability Mars, is opposite Saturn, which natally is tied up with your third. It must have felt hard to have such a big responsibility of looking after two young kids when you were only six years old yourself. Mandy, I've always felt that people think I'm prepared to do things before I am really ready to do them. Howard. That statement reflects a pattern in your life related to Mars opposite Saturn and Neptune and was brought out when you had to look after your little brother and sister. I'm afraid we have to draw to a close now. But remember that by understanding some of the childhood issues connected to that aspect, you are taking the first step toward working constructively with your feelings of inadequacy and fears of not being ready or good enough for what you have to do. After that you are more free to bring the Mars and Saturn-Neptune principles together in a new way. Remember, the higher self, or whatever you want to call it, doesn't burden you with any aspect or pattern just for the fun of torturing you. Hopefully today's seminar has given all of you some guidelines for getting in touch with and better understanding your patterns and life statements as seen in the chart. Now it's up to you to do what you can to work on, transform, or change any of these. The past may be coloring the way you see life, but your future depends on what you do with it right now.